It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Renee Ritchie's here, uh, Alex Lindsay, and filling in for Andy Anako, the great Don McAllister. Yes, we're waiting for our Apple Watches. We'll talk about what to expect when yours arrives this Friday, or maybe even whether yours arrives this Friday. And don't you try to return that edition watch without uh, special inspections. No shaving the gold off. Apple's going to be a little bit strict on that one. There's news, too, from other areas of the Apple universe. It's all coming up next on MacBreak Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 451. Recorded Tuesday, April 21st, 2015. Yoga pants for your wrist. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Trunk Club. Have the wardrobe you've always dreamed of handpicked by your own personal stylist. Go to trunkclub.com slash twit and join Trunk Club today for free. And by SmartThings. SmartThings lets you monitor, control, and automate your home from wherever you are using your smartphone. Right now, SmartThings is offering Mac Break Weekly listeners 10% off any home security or solution kit and get free shipping in the U.S. when you go to smartthings.com slash twit. And don't forget to use the offer code TWIT at checkout. And by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash MacBreak. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash MacBreak. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we break weekly about Macs or something. I don't know. Andy Anako not with us. He's in Yosemite, where a limited bandwidth is keeping him from the internet. For the he's at the Coco Conference, the Yosemite Coco Conference. But I love it. Don McAllister filling in on monitor number one. Great to see I you. I can't fill in for Andy. No one can fill in for Andy. I'm just here as a as a as a guest. That's all. No, no that, thanks nice for inviting me. Screencasts mm -hmm. online. Indeed. Course.com. Don is uh, coming to us from Liverpool. And we've deviated from our uh, matching appearance since the last appearance because your your hair has grown rapidly. <laughs> You've, I, I can't believe it. Do you find that depressing? <laughs> <laughs> it is a little bit. You know, it must, be, must be sleeping in the grove. I'm relieved. Sleep, Somebody so. told me, I don't know if they were punking me or not, but sometimes when you shave your head, they said it never grows back. And I... Well, wow. They yeah, scared me, that's... but it did grow back. And it's grown back. It's almost now to the normal length. In fact... I actually have a, on my to-do list to make an appointment to get a haircut. Oh, go on. Rub it in. Rub it in. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> charity. Man. I'm sorry. Good to see you, though. Also with us today, Mr. Uh, Alex Lindsay. Where are you calling us from? Coming in from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, PA. He's in Johnny Ives' white room. Actually, it's more of a <laughs> more of an ivory today. Yeah, a little ivory yeah. today, yes. And, of course, from Montreal, Canada, and imore.com, Rene Ritchie. Great to see you. Salut, Leo. Ça va bien? What? <laughs> How are you, Leo? Uh, what? Did, did my ears just go out, or did you speak to me in some sort of Star Wars language? The language of your people. Have you been watching Star Wars? Did you watch all six movies uh, back to back? All three, all three movies, the unmolested versions, yes. Oh, ooh, <laughs> now we know where you stand. I never realized that... The, uh, we talk, I think we talked about this last... Uh, no, no wait, I wasn't here last week, by the way. Thank you, Andy, for uh, hosting, uh, doing the hosting chores for me. Um, I don't. So maybe we didn't talk about it, but... Uh, there's this whole thing about going back to the original and the, and is fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, but you, but so you only accept the episodes four uh, through six as the canonical story. Well, Wars. the other ones are just different. I just I just classify them as something different. They have a different purpose. They have different sort of. Uh, they're 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 different. The the Jar Jar era we call it. Yes. Of course, I mean, that's the one that Alex Lindsay worked effects. on. I just yeah, want to point out effects. excellent specular highlights. Yes. On a yes. Princess Amidala's uh, uh, the starship. The chrome ship is peerless. <laughs> yeah, see, there. That's all. That's all I need. The, the queen ship was was beautiful. That's all I need. You know, the yeah. rest of it. You know. Uh, are you amazed, Alex, by the the uh, lengths to which uh, these fans go to create the canonical versions? This is the uh, video that he uh, put up on uh, YouTube. Um, I don't. You know, 
you know, there's been there, people re-edit and edit, and uh, there's been there was the um, you know there was a, there's been a couple different edits of some of the uh, a variety of these, and uh, I, I don't. I don't actually. I'm not that surprised. And people make their own Star Wars movies. Uh, so, yeah, fan fiction. So, but but know, the point here, and I think actually, if you look at this video, it's pretty well taken. Is that the Blu-ray, which is what we're getting, I believe, in the digital versions? Really, the color correction was terrible. Um, I mean, look at the how the blue, the red, uh, magenta uh, hues, the cast, uh, and then the despecial. What is it called? The despecialized edition. Yeah, yeah that's what we're looking which at. Which is right an here. attempt kind of to get back to, to the original theatrical. Uh, 1977 release, um, and it, and the guy's using so many interesting techniques. Somebody told me he got a job uh, out of this right. because he's so good. He's doing rotoscoping at the Moss Eisley uh, uh, um, bar scene. You know, as they go into the bar, there's a f f pathetic CGI. <laughs> animal. The real question is, how do you get back to how do you get back to you know the fact that Han shot first? I mean, that's, that's what the, they're trying to do. So they're using the 77. Uh, there, there isn't a print. Lucas has kept the prints out of circulation, but there, there are. There's a laser disc, right? Laser, there's a laser mm -hmm. disc, which I own. I, you know, I didn't realize. Yeah. Look at the differences. There's some huge differences. So um, this is actually fun to watch, the despecialized. Uh, if you watch the Blu-ray versions, the original special effects hold up really well, but the CGI they added looks terrible now. It looks like Doom from the 1980s. Right, because it was done in the 1980s, or was it the yeah. 90s? Well, it depends on the which which CGI. I think that the space shots will actually look fairly good. Yes, the I mean, cleanups I think, will look you know, good, but the animals look horrible. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that was still kind of a work in progress on some of those you know those were all done in the late 90s and yeah, yeah. you know i think that we, this was pre-hobbit pre you know a lot of those things uh, you know i think that the 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 stuff that what you what i noticed a lot and of course the stuff that i was i didn't do um but i but i definitely saw a lot of it getting built um was uh, you know a lot of the space shots and um and i thought those if you look at the dynamism of of a lot of the the moves and shots and everything else it was much more impressive than than the original. The original, the problem yeah. you really got into with, um, just to get a little geeky for a second, um, the problem you, you get into with the original TIE Fighters and, and uh, X-Wings was that those would be, three of those guys flying would be literally 14 passes of film that they would go through to, to comp it together, to, to pull it all together. And every time you did that, you would scratch it. So if you, you only got one or two tries before you had to start over again yeah. and like literally reshoot everything all over right. again. And so you get to a point where the scratches are worse than the, than the, uh, than the actual effect. And so when we got back to digital, um, you know, it allowed you to do things over and over and over again. And so yeah. I think that the, uh, you, a lot of those kinds of the hard surface effects, I think in the, in the re-releases were, um, you know, the stuff like the, the ships here, I think were, I think were very impressive. Um, I think that the, Characters, yeah, we're, we're still a little challenged because I think it was still a work in progress. Have you seen the new robot, though, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Based on when they said it was physical, mm. when, when the trailer came out, they said it was physical, and I was like, there is no what, way, man. What, 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 you know? And I guess the one that, that was done actually for the movie was a bit more of a prop, you know, that was rotoed out, you know, so it did, it wasn't what we have now seen at Celebration, which is kind of running on its own. It was still a, a bit of a prop um, that, that they had to fix up, but. They actually have uh, a patent for BB-8, which I think is hysterical. Yeah. Uh, Sphero. Mm -hmm. We know Sphero because yeah. we saw them um, at Macworld. They make a really interesting thing. So I've talked to Father Robert, who I believe is going to build this for... And maybe we can enlist you, Alex, because he says he can build the mechanics of it easily. But right. uh, it's the paint job he can't do. So maybe we can enlist, <laughs> enlist actually, you. I have the perfect people for that. Yeah, that, I figured you would. Yeah, so because it has to not um, only be painted but distressed. No, no, no. I what you want is to get guys that actually worked, you know, on the film. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. so what this so what this is apparently, I'm told by Robert. We've we, I think with looking at the patent, they figured out the the big ball, the bottom of BB-8 is independent, rolls, mm -hmm. and and like a segue, uh, balances and is controlled. Um, and 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 then it has well, within it's it, a giant Sphero, isn't it? I mean, it's a giant, it's a giant Sphero. Yeah. And then within it, and Sphero was this cool thing. Now, I think I have one. We have to find our Spheros. And then within it, he believes there's a rod, a magnetic rod that doesn't... Ex this is what's interesting. That top part is completely independent. You could pull it off. It's not attached in any way. Yeah, it must be levitating Mag in, it's by magnetic. magnetic. Yeah. There's yeah. a magnetic rod in the bottom larger ball that the magnets in the top part position center themselves over. So when you control the bottom ball, you also control, you see that, the independently, mm -hmm. the position 
of the top piece. The top piece obviously has to also spin. I think that's controlled by the top Amazing. piece. It's magical. It is magical. It's a really cool. wonderful effect. And they're going to sell it as a toy. Yeah. Ooh. Like that. Oh, yeah. We live in wonderful times. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. All I, can, all I can say is, is that I, I want that. And, and I think about everybody who's seen it is going to have to have... If, if it works at all, if it gets reviews that it worked at all, everyone's going to have to have one. Well, it, and, and so this is a footage maybe you haven't seen from the Star Wars conference, recent footage, like like a couple of days ago, where it comes out, it says hi, it rolls around, R2-D2's there, and it is, it's real. It's not <laughs> fake. Um, so cool. what, I, what I love about this is that J.J. Abrams, who could easily have CGI'd this or puppetried this, made it. That's to me. That's a good sign. I know people are worried about. Uh, it's like like a lot of the sets, though. Some of the images that have been released from the sets, they actually built the yeah, you know built some better. of the craft, and it's yeah, it's, 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 it's well, and, and, very and that's been things. the case. I think that they might have gone a little overboard on some of the stuff with the with the other episodes, but you know there were some pretty big sets built for oh, even I know. The pre prequels. Yeah. I mean, you know, so that's that. You you do want to create that scale. It's very hard to do that in CG when it there gets it too big. A lot of times there's set extensions, um, right. but. Uh, yeah, they do painted plates for the extra stuff. But they're shooting these at the Ealing Studios. Where there's a lot. These are big, giant sound stages. It's like a oh, MagSafe yeah. head. Yeah. <laughs> it's a MagSafe head. It's so awesome. That's all I got to say. By the way, we can confirm that the new MagSafe adapter on the new Mac PowerBook 13 is much sturdier. The magnet is like much... You have to work at it to get it off. So good news. Andy will be happy about that. The magnets on some of the watch traps are incredibly strong. You've been mm. you've been now to the Apple store. You've seen, you've watched. I've seen videos uh, and photos from you and Serenity trying them on and everything. Yeah. Are you excited? Yeah, I I mean I've gone several times now. Um I went to the Palo Alto debut um for the try-ons and they had uh, I, know, they I had can't like believe you came down. In fact, I saw the picture. We we talked about this of you and uh Dalrymple talking to Tim, just standing there like regular guys talking to Tim Cook. I wasn't expecting that. I was talking to Jim, and then Tim came in from the back of the store and then said, hi, hi, Jim, hi, Renee. And, we, and he knew you? What we ordered. He didn't have uh, to be introduced? I, I, I mean, he has PR people, so I don't know. They, they, he's probably briefed. Uh, he might have a little microphone. Do you have to his, sell his, Renee Ritchie? Yeah. He's iMore.com. Or his Apple Watch might be telling him. <laughs> like, it just taps out the person's name on his wrist. To the right, it's Mr. Yep, Jim Dalrymple. He's at the loop. Jim is hard to miss, though, in Jim's defense. Yeah, Jim's very distinctive. <laughs> uh, wow, I mean, that was pretty neat. That must have been yeah, really awesome. Did you actually he, interview him at all or just kind of... We just spoke chat? for a few minutes. He was saying how much he loved like using it for sports and athletics. The same kind of things he said before, yeah. but it, he's very gracious. I mean, he comes off as incredibly passionate and sincere, which is the same way he comes off on his talks. Yeah. It's kind of neat because, I mean, he has his talking points, but they... they he, mm -hmm. And I don't think he's an actor, so that gives me, gives me some sense that he's genuine in his uh, approbation. Now... Yeah, and it wasn't just us. He went around and spoke to customers at the store as well. He, he took about half an hour. Steve used to do that. That was his store, yep. the Palo Alto store. He used to do that. Loved doing that. And I think Tim knows that. And this is kind of as much an homage to Steve as anything else. Steve would have loved to have been there for that, I'm sure. Yeah. So I, uh, I'm a little concerned. Friday, April 24th, we're recording this on April 21st. So Friday, three days away, four days away. Usually by now, I would have had a happy-go-lucky text message from Apple saying, Good news, your watch is on its way. I haven't. Nail biter. Has, uh, you said Serenity has? Serenity got, yeah, a couple people, uh, people in the U.S. who ordered the aluminum ones uh, who had April 24th as their early shipment date have been getting, uh, I don't know if they've got actual notifications, but their status has changed on the online ordering. Okay, system. mine is, and I'm looking. Now, did everybody get April 24th through May 8th? That's That was the, mm -hmm. so just because. Uh, if you order the I think aluminum. only those, yeah, only those that ordered in the very, very first, uh, you know, few minutes of the ordering process. It rapidly changed to like four to six weeks on most models. Oh, yeah. No, but I ordered in the first few minutes. Oh, I, okay, a little. 12.10, I think. What time yeah, was it? <laughs> yeah, so that's probably too late. But anyway, it says delivers 4.24 to 5.8, but it also says uh, processing items. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I ordered stainless steel, and, and I ordered a 12.01, and it said uh, between mid-May and, and late May. Wow, so I was lucky. Well, yeah. you know what? That's what it said in mine, too, on the 42 millimeter, uh, but the 38 millimeter. I'm going to get the little yeah. one. Uh, Lisa's. Gonna, it's actually Lisa's. She's gonna let me use it until um, the bigger one comes a few weeks later. So See, mine's the uh, mine's the forty two stainless steel with the Milanese loop, and that's, me too. That's still that's still down for for uh, Friday till 
the week after. They're drop shipping from China as usual? They're staging in the U.S., I believe. I think they've, they've moved a bunch of them to the U.S. I okay. think that rumors wrote about that. They had a source that said a bunch of them had been moved to the U.S. to get ready for the shipping for Friday. So chat room, I got a ship notification for my watch charger. <laughs> It'll arrive tomorrow. Uh, my card, Kalen says, my card has been charged. The status has changed. Uh, Tripod says, I got a FedEx tracking number for Friday. Tripod, what does it say is the origination of that? Because usually it'll say Shenzhen, China. Uh, but so this might confirm that story that they are they are in fact staging from the U.S. and would reassure me because if they're staging from the U.S., they could reasonably. Uh, I think it still says China because they've done that before and it still said country of origin on the shipment. <laughs> oh, and if you paid with Apple Pay, some people have gotten the Apple Pay billing and has gone through. Oh, I should check. How do you keep a How do you keep a moron in suspense? I'll tell you how. <laughs> Right after this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, they're keeping me in suspense. So none of you, I just want to check. No. have gotten... Uh, no. no, July. What's it going to be in the UK? Is it different in the UK? Uh, um, it, pff, it, well, as far as I know, no one in the UK has had a shipping notice as yet. But on Twitter, people have said uh, there's a rumor that uh, possibly they go out tomorrow. I uh, also had uh, another guy on Twitter say that in Australia, they get the, sh they get the shipping notices like the day before. So there's still hope. But uh, it depends where they're coming from, I suppose. If they were coming from China to the UK, it's going to take ages. But if they have got some here, uh, hopefully they could actually ship them out in a couple of days. Right. We should. We'll soon find out. Oh. <laughs> So the thing with the watch is that we waited for the, we waited for one event, then we waited for the second event, then we waited for the yeah. try-ons, now we're waiting for the shipment and the delayed right. shipment. Beyonce got hers. In fact, she got one that no one else has. This is a this is a gold link band. Here she is in her private plane. She gets an exit row every time. And uh, <laughs> there's the uh, that's pretty. I, mean, I wasn't taken with the gold, but with a gold strap. Now, I might be interested then, but I'm not interested, yeah. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Well, let me think how much that must have cost. Hey, Don, if yeah. you could reconnect, I think we're getting a lot of noise out of your uh, oh, okay. connection. Um, wow. Yeah, that's one of the bands they haven't announced publicly yet. There was a few of them. Um, they've shown off now, I think, a, a red one, a yellow one, a dark blue one, a gold one. that right. they that are just not publicly available, but they're giving These out to... And this is, I think, something you get from uh, some of the, the watch designers and Angela Aarons and so on and so forth of the kind of the classic fashion rollout, which is that we're going to show you things that you can't even own right now. And of course, you're going to want it and then you're going to spend $30,000 on it or whatever. I mean, this is uh, we've done some streams for fashion shows and, and you definitely see this kind of buildup of of the process. So it's very, very classic, uh, you know, more fashion industry than tech industry. Tripod says that his... Went through Canada first. That's got to really annoy You're Renee. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, like, I ordered the black stainless steel, and I knew going in that that one was not going to be available yeah. right away. But it, uh, it reminds me of that story when you look at Beyonce's watch. There's that story that you know everyone drinks the same Coke from the janitor to the president of the United States. It's all the same Coke. It's just the glass that you drink it in that right. varies. The can. And these are all the same Apple Watch. Yeah. yeah, these are all the same Apple Watches. It's just mine is going to be you know in, in aluminum or stainless steel. Someone else's is going to be in a lot of gold. Yeah. God, I just, you know, I, and, and I even, I don't even, I feel bad being, you know, wanting it and being, and worrying about it. It's like, come on, there's so many more important things in the world than that. Let me make that bigger here. Hmm. And come on, Beyonce, really? <laughs> now, I think, now the interesting thing, Beyonce, uh, of course, and Jay Z, her husband, uh, are publicly announced supporters of Jay Z's uh, record, or not not exactly record label, stream, streaming music <laughs> service title, and I gotta think that Apple's sending out these really extra special ones to woo these artists over to Beats. I don't, I don't know if it's wooing. I think I think they're looking directly at just influence. You know, seeing these great cool artists wearing the the really high end watch. I, I don't think that they. I I don't yeah. think the marketing is connected to Beats. I think they're just yeah. really they want the cool kids to be wearing it. By the way, Beyonce is in fact not drinking the same can of Coke as you and me. She's drinking the same can of Canada Dry ginger ale. 
Um, oh, good just so you know. <laughs> Karl Lagerfeld had the gold watch with the gold link bracelet oh. as well. And he was there was a picture of it, but he it was still on the setup screen. So it looked like he hadn't even paired it yet, but he was still wearing it. And, <laughs> Somebody come here and pair it for me. I don't know what to do. Um, have you seen the diamond encrusted one? No. There's a there's a there's a there's one that they're they've already started talking about. I guess they're gonna do as soon as it, it's released. It's it's the gold watch. And then it's diamond encrusted all the way around, and evidently, I think the the street price is one hundred and seventeen thousand dollars. <laughs> same watch, same glass, but uh, I'm sticking with, with my uh, good old Republican cloth watch, the Moto three hundred and sixty. I'm I'm going to be a man of the people. The plebeians, the plebeians. Although uh, Android is uh, Google's clearly stung a little bit by the fact that the Apple Watch, uh, in its first weekend, outsold. All the Android Wear watches and, ever. And I think that what's interesting about this is also at a price that was two or three times yeah. what they were selling it at. I mean, that's the real insult is that is that you're really talking about something that was sold that 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 you know everyone's worked really hemmed and hawed. Is it two hundred? Is it three hundred? And Apple said, no, it'll be like six hundred average. Yeah. You know, like you know that that's what we can and we can sell all in a day what you sold over a year at three times the cost. It's quite a it's quite a juggernaut. Google has announced that we don't know. It's not clear, although some have said. Yeah, the current watches will be upgradable. Others have said that's not true, that they're going to support uh, Wi-Fi just as the Apple Watch does. They're going to take it one better, though. As long as your watch is online and your phone is online, even if they're not in the same locale or the same network, they will talk to one another. Nice. So that Now, I don't know when that's coming, but that's an interesting... Uh, but I have a Pebble, and I've I've used a Moto, and I've used a, one of the Samsungs, and when you when you actually go and pick up an Apple Watch, the build quality is... They're, they're not comparable. Like the other ones look nice when you just yes. are looking at them, but the build quality of the Apple Watch, the materials, the finish, all the stuff that Apple's yes. famous for, it's, it's a huge difference. Yes. I think the, the, oh, the haptics things as well, is, is that fairly unique for the Apple Watch? Because I've only actually yeah. used the Pebble and that sort of vibrates, but I, I think the, um, you know, the, the ceramic back with the sensors and the, uh, this uh, taptic touch that they're going to have, I think that's going to be interesting to see how people actually uh, either enjoy or dislike that particular aspect. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting, isn't it? Mm. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I want to try it. I, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ready. I've got my iPhone all polished up. <laughs> I just want and, the tracking. And the camera at your watch and, and pair it up. And I do think that this is going to be good for Android. I think that, you know, there's a lot that Android's going, even though that they've been stung by this a little bit, I think that there's a lot of uh, advantages because there are going to be a lot of people that don't want to spend $500 sure. on a watch. And they're going to get excited and we're going to see new... They're going to see the possibilities, and of course, there'll be a bunch of Android developers that develop something very similar, but you can do it for a lot less money. It has to be really frustrating, though, you know? I mean, they do everything you can for Samsung, too, and Apple just waltzes in and says, yeah, we'll take it from here. Well, the interesting thing, though, is, is that they're going to gain critical mass very, very quickly. And I really see, like, the, the second phase of the Apple Watch being, you know, once as early adopters get them and we start to use them, and then the developers start to tweak the applications because people are using them in real life. And then, you know, third-party manufacturers start to realize mm -hmm. that there's this huge critical mass of, of Apple Watch users yeah. who have, you know, this physical... I think the physical interaction is going to be the big thing that will finally sell it to, to the masses. When people start seeing people pay for things with their watch and when they see people start opening doors with their watch and, you know, interacting with the car and stuff like that. Um, I, I do think Apple will have the critical mass to actually sort of generate third parties to, to, to get more involved and, and to start to create a physical infrastructure that actually interworks with the Apple Watch. And at that point, then, it, I, I think it will really take off. <laughs> so I, I, thought it, I thought it was interesting that, that uh, Microsoft, I guess, has made it available. PowerPoint is you're now yeah. going to be able to advance slides on your, on your watch. <laughs> You know, there you go. Apple That's watch. what a watch is for. <laughs> no, but you can see a lot of guys that present. I, yeah. You know, you present a lot, and I present a lot of slides. And, and I don't know if you present a lot of slides, but I present a lot of slides. And, and I thought, oh, that would be really nice not to have something that I'm constantly, you know, one of these, you know, that I'm constantly setting down somewhere or trying to figure it out. I'm just being able to tap my watch while I'm talking. I, Do you I like think that. the Apple Watch will follow the same path that the iPod followed, where you have the first edition and then you start doing colored editions? Maybe there'll be a swatch uh, priced Apple Watch and and that's just kind a of band thing. with no watch, but I don't know if Apple's really interested in that. that yeah. Almost like the iPod Shuffle version where there's no screen, but I don't know how much interest they have. <laughs> what would that do? You'd have well, it'd be if, a, if the like health and fitness bit. stuff. They could, yeah. yeah, they could they could do the fitness tracking things the way that sort of the iPod Shuffle did a very specific subsection of iPod functionality. But I don't know what their interest level is in, in that because they've since the iPod they've been more about making computers more personal, not necessarily just doing devices. 
I think, I think just, that. I, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say oh. on this Instagram photo of Carl Lagerfeld's watch that has not been set up, just cracks me up. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's just like, well, I you know, I don't know how to use this, but I'm going to wear it because it. Well, that's a true fashion statement, then. Isn't that it? is. I can afford a fifty thousand dollar <laughs> watch that I don't know how to use. He probably didn't use a watch before that, or of course, or they're probably all or ornamentation for him anyway. Yeah. And then, uh, and you mentioned Tim. Here's the uh, picture of Tim's. Uh, oops, sorry, you just got the the red. The, Tim's with the red crown. Yeah, <clears throat> that's that's kind of interesting. He's wearing a. He probably just has a prototype. He's wearing the white floral elastomer. Maybe the red crown is like the ones that they uh, they, they see the employees. Aren't they the ones that match the 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 gold edition with the I red band? I think there is a red, red crown, crown yeah. isn't there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the he's gold just wearing the wrong crown. band. Well, he has a stainless steel watch. He's very, he's an operations guy. He's very practical. <laughs> he doesn't have a gold one. You know, I think that that's the right message to send. Let's yeah. not. Let's well, it's not. like we talked about this before where it's like Jeff Williams, who's the vice president of operations, drives a 10-year-old Toyota right. Or, right. or Honda or something. They have very different priorities. The Apple Watch Nano. I like that idea. <laughs> the shuffle. <laughs> now, it's, it's much cheaper now with analog hands. <laughs> yeah, an analog watch. <laughs> <laughs> Gruber has an interesting article on Daring Fireball. He talks about uh, discovering, it's so funny, discovering uh, facerrepo.com, which is, and I've been using it for a long time, which is the place where you can get custom watch faces for Android Wear. And there's some very cool ones, although he mocks it. <clears throat> and uh, and writes an ap apologia for Apple uh, and why Apple will never offer custom faces. One reason, good reason. Because of the uh, OLED screen on the watch, it, you kind of want to choose faces that promote battery life. Uh, in other words, with a lot of black. And he says there is a custom design in a sense because the Mickey face must have been designed in conjunction with Disney. Licensed, yeah. Um, but he says the 10 different faces, which are almost, not quite, but almost infinitely customizable with what Apple calls complications, are... are likely going to be that way. He says there's no way to set up a watch face that's ugly or doesn't look very Apple watchy. And I have to say, one of the things about Face or Repo is you can get an ugly, a very ugly <laughs> yeah. face for your Android Wear watch if you wish. <clears throat> uh, he says, I don't see that. That's by design. I don't see that changing. Uh, he quotes Andy saying uh, in a tweet, like, what if Apple said, we don't trust you to choose well-designed iPhone wallpaper? And Gruber points out, we don't have to imagine that. Until iOS 4 in 2010, you, you couldn't choose the wallpaper um, on uh, on your iPhone. That, the I think, is the most years. apt part of that because it, originally they just couldn't composite it uh, properly. It was it was too much for the phone and the processors back then. And when they could properly composite the layers, they let you do it. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a lot of arguments about the watch faces right now, but um, there's a couple things to remember. One, there's no native apps yet, and developers can't make watch faces without native apps. Trying to shoot a watch face as a series of PNG images over Bluetooth is not going to be successful for anyone. So it's, it's until there's native code running on the phone, having a, a discussion about... Uh, watch faces is just incredibly premature. Yeah. But other than that, they've already ditched uh, the photos and the time-lapse watch face because of power uh, reasons. Because anytime you have a pixel lit up on OLED, it uses power and a photo watch face lights up every pixel, unlike the very linear line art style watch faces they're doing there. The, the culture thing is harder though, because you know Apple does allow custom keyboards now, which a lot of us thought they might never do. And there's a custom keyboard extension. So maybe one day there'll be a custom watch face extension. I don't, I don't know. I don't think there will be, but it's always possible. And it's hard to speak in Apple. Absolutes. But uh, going back to just the watch face things, not having it on the first uh, version of the shipping product, uh, I think that's a given. It's just absolutely a given at this point. You know who uh, will get a watch sooner than later? Developers. Apple, according to uh, Mac Rumors, Apple has uh, started sending out emails to iOS developers offering them a chance to purchase a 42 millimeter sport with a blue band with a guaranteed shipment of April 28th in order for them to start developing so uh it's not guaranteed the they say random selection quantities are limited <clears throat> but if you're a developer look for that email you have till uh till uh, thursday to uh let them know that you want it well that must be us only because i don't think i received that email yeah this are you a developer uh, i'm registered as a developer yeah well i guess yeah, i am I've too got, aren't I've i got apps yeah. yeah i didn't get it either yeah mm. Maybe you have to actually really be a developer. <laughs> you, have, you have to have at least two apps in the app store to get this email. I don't know. We have, we have six, I think, and we didn't get one. Oh, well, that sucks. 
Yeah. Check your spam folder. Renee, Tim knows you like that name, so you should be okay. <laughs> uh, Gruber's laughing at the heavily skeuomorphic watch faces on face, or, uh, face repo, including the, uh, this one of the Android. <laughs> this is You could have this on your Android Wear. Android robot uh, urinating on a gold apple. <clears throat> I might download that right now. Just, just to make people angry. Uh, one of the things also is police, because like, Apple, Apple takes editorial responsibility for their content and right. policing IP on this stuff is, especially when you're a company well, that gets as much scrutiny as Apple, is non-trivial. Yeah, and this is actually a big issue for Google because a lot of the watches are uh, copyright and trademark violations. There's Tog Heuer watches, watch faces. There's Patek Philippe. There's a lot of brand names in face repo, and uh, these things are often more nuanced than internet anger allows for. Yes, gosh darn you, internet anger. Didn't Apple have to settle with the the switch clock people? Mm -hmm. when well, they, they but they outright the, they outright that the stole face. that watch face yeah. from the switch the Swiss railway folks. That was just they paid for it, and then they stopped using it immediately. Afterwards. Yeah, that was absolute <laughs> just outright thievery. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. A few people in the chat room I'm noticing are saying they have uh, received notifications. In fact, some have gone in and checked just because we've been talking about it. Uh, Webmaster305 says, yes, my Apple Watch order was updated, preparing for shipment. So uh, check check your um, check your uh, your uh, Apple Store page and see what's uh, what's going on. Um, at, by, <laughs> 9 to 5 Mac, good news, Alex, says Keynote has been updated for a watch-based remote. Yep. <laughs> so it's not just PowerPoint. Good news. Exactly. Oh I, yeah, you, you as soon as as soon as you said it, I was just thinking all the things that you do when you're presenting or doing a class or whatever, being able to drive be it to your yeah. watch, it's gonna yeah. be it's gonna be excited. Just just it stays with you, you know. Now you just need mute and unmute. You so the say. PowerPoint for iPhone is now Apple Watch. Um, there are a number of updated apps coming all the time. What else uh, have have you guys seen updated to support they the watch? Showed off Twitterific, I think, yesterday. Nice. So tweets yeah, would go to the gorgeous. watch. Yeah. Yeah. And the Twitter app the new, been updated. Uh, yeah, the Apple remote as well for your Apple TV. That's which is awesome. Fantastic. Because yeah. I, you know, I, just I lose, lose my those every, yeah. all the time. And it's such yeah. a pain to take your phone out and get the application. And yeah. Although the app does work fine, but to have it just on your wrist all the time would be great. <clears throat> yeah, that's built in. And so if, uh, if you have an Apple Watch and you have these apps on your iPhone, that's all you need to worry about. Once you pair the watch, it'll automatically update it. To, uh, the Apple Watch companion app, the one that runs on your iPhone, has a second tab that says store on it. And come Friday, that'll be lit up and you'll see a bunch uh, of apps in there and then that you'll be able to take the the apps that are listed there and transfer their watch kit extension to your phone i don't open this app anymore because it's just taunting me good morning <laughs> if you have an apple watch you can pair it with your yeah. iphone here yeah don't don't taunt me like that did, did i read there was a limit to the number of third-party apps you could actually have on the watch oh well, maybe I mean, there's limited eight, memory, right? I mean, it's got eight gigabytes, and I think two gigabytes is reserved for music, a half a gigabyte for images, and the rest for the system and for apps. By the way, if you want to watch the videos, looks like they're all done now. The uh, how-to videos have been updated and are available not only, of course, at Apple.com, but on the uh, Watch uh, app itself on your uh, iPhone. So you can watch uh, all the videos they've made now. Let's see, health and fitness, digital touch. Faces message. Oh, they're not. They're not done. There's still some Apple unfinished pay, yeah. ones, aren't there? Boy, they come on, Apple. What's holding up? It's holding you up. <clears throat> Johnny has to approve each one, Leo. It's my guess that there are people we know who are working on these videos right now. In fact, I more than a guess, <laughs> and I'm not talking about you, Alex Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, they've been they've been shooting these. I've been told they've been shooting these in a warehouse in the Bay Area for some time now. And can you imagine? It must be that white room warehouse where they light everything up and and the and the amount of uh, trouble doing something like that must be. Well, you see the heat pattern from orbit. Yeah. So still to come, Apple Pay activity and workout, but they have added uh, phone calls, Siri, Maps, and music, and I think. As we sit here waiting for our text message, <laughs> you you got something to do. You can watch these videos. It's been I found I mean, it very can, helpful to actually kind yeah. of look at the videos so that I, I understand how it all is going to work. I think the goal is that you're an expert in the watch by the time the watch arrives. Right. You know that's that's the key to the operation. Right. 
All right. <laughs> Have we exhausted the topic for today? Because you know next week all we're going to be doing is going, <laughs> I'm hoping all we're going to be doing is, <laughs> so you won't have one, Renee. Yeah. So you won't Probably be going, <laughs> Alex, no, you won't have one. July. <laughs> Maybe you and I will have one, Don. We just don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully by this time next week, even if it doesn't arrive on the 24th, that's still you know, a couple of days after possibly, but fingers crossed. We'll do a uh, unboxing the minute mine gets here. It's shipping to the studio. And my hope was to be able to do that live on Before You Buy this Friday at uh, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. So watch BYB. If I get it, we'll unbox it. Nice. He's stainless steel, just like you, the stainless steel with the Milanese loop. We have good yeah, my, taste. Good taste. That's right. That's right. Actually, it was. A, it, to be honest, it was one of those last-minute things, though, because I, I was going to go with the, uh, the, the the black sports, um, and then like literally the day before, because I was so, I was sort of you know undecided right the way through, and then so like tw twelve hours before ordering, I said no, I'll go with the stainless steel and Milanese loop. Sight unseen. Speaking of Milanese, Milan Design Week, Milano, Italia Design Week is uh, going on, and Johnny Ive is there. <laughs> Hanging Gianni. with Carl and the gang. Gianni. Gianni. Hey, Johnny. <laughs> hey, Johnny Ive. What do you got for us? Um, beautiful sport band, The Colors. Bellissimo. Bellissimo. A showcase at the Milan Salone del Mobile Design Fair in Italia, which, by the way, 9 to 5 Mac typos to Italy. Um... Attended by Apple executives, including Phil Schiller, Mark Newsom, and, of course, Sir Johnny Ive. And uh, they showed off. Are these new, these bands, or is it just... Uh, they're they're un, un, not publicly available or uh, previously unannounced. I don't know what the right term is, but, uh, yeah, there's yellow and red and midnight blue. And here is Mark Newsom. He's wearing a black sport band. We don't have a black sport, but Newsom is, of course, a very famous designer, friend of Johnny Ives, uh, who has uh, joined Apple last year. Ceylon and uh, his Mobile. watches that he designed are very similar in many ways to what the Apple Watch turned out to be. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. So he should Especially get some. Straps. He should get some credit. He's strap Absolutely. man. They call him the strap man uh, <laughs> in, in Cupertino. <laughs> uh, this is, I guess, is the best picture we have here of uh, of a rack of straps. Looks like purple. Bright red, a nice bright red. I like that. I'm waiting for the Samuel Jackson Instagram with his purple Apple Watch. Yeah, he should have a purple one. You could take the red watch or the blue watch. Um, well, the red strap mustn't be too far away because it'll be a product red strap, won't it? <clears throat> oh, I product would... red strap. I like yeah. it. Yeah, so I would imagine we'll see that in the not-too-distant future. And apparently... People were squeeing over this, Apple's innovative new UK <laughs> plug design. <clears throat> that's rather nice. Actually, that's pretty cool. So it's flat in your pocket. Because mm. the UK yeah. plugs, they, they have big, heavy prongs. They're, they're quite bulky, but they're extremely well designed for safety. Um, you know, if you notice on the, the, the prongs sticking out, you've got insulation and uh, the, the metal tips. And then the earth is actually longer. And that in a UK plug, that actually opens a, a gate so that the, the live and the neutral can actually go in. So it's extremely well designed, but it is very bulky. Um, and yeah. I've seen another one. There's another travel plug, which is similar to this, but like a, a fold, uh, sort of twist and fold one, which has been out like a USB adapter uh, with the, the UK prongs. I and mean, that's the first uh, charger from, a, you know, a, a big, presumably if it is the Apple charger, that's the first time I've seen that sort of design from a, a major manufacturer. I like it. Mm, it's good. I think right. we should change all plug receptacles to duplicate the UK plug. <laughs> you know, I, as a as a consumer, they drive me crazy because it's always like this huge <laughs> thing that you have to carry yeah. around. Yeah. Uh, the only one worse than than the UK is South Africa because it's like yeah. giant giant <laughs> circular. And um, and the uh, but as a production person, I love UK plugs. I wish everything was UK. Oh, yeah. Uh, because you know, when you're putting together all your gear and you're putting it, it's like chunk 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 chunk, yeah. and you just know that there's no way that's coming out. Well, those the are real strange chargers, thing is, right? Yeah, sorry. when I come over to the States, I always find that those little American flimsy two prong things, they just fall out the wall. You plug them in and then they, if, some, <laughs> if you put some, some yeah. weight on it, it just sort of droops down or it, it drops out. And, or and not it's pop up Yeah, that doesn't happen <laughs> a lot in London, does it? <laughs> Sloppy plug. No. You put those in, you, out could, of the you, wall. Could, 
The thing is, is that the, if, if you if you took a UK plug and stuck it in, you could repel off of that out the window if you needed to. I mean, so it would it's just a be proper like, metric just, plug, Alex. Yeah, exactly. What in Canada? You're just the same as us, right, Dan? Yeah, we yeah. we have to be Leo, otherwise we couldn't use anything, <laughs> right? So at least the at least the Europeans have the round pins, and they're a little bit more you know stable. But those flat uh, pins, yeah, I don't really like those either. I like the UK plug. Ours but, are meant to support a cable industry, folks. What are your priorities? Here? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, this picture comes from uh, famed, apparently famed rugby player and captain turned cyclist Will Carling, and I guess he's received his watch. And he, yeah. it, unlike others, this guy he knows his stuff. He took a picture of the plug. I think he was answering some questions on Twitter too. He was oh, neat. clued in. That's really that's pretty cool, isn't it? I like this red. Uh, yeah. yeah. Although, according, according to those folks, uh, those snarky folks at 9 to 5, Mr. Carling is wearing his bottom band upside down. There he. Um, Mr. Carling, you're wearing, I can clearly see the medium-large sizing mark. Uh, mm, this is, uh, so red, navy, light pink, new bands, and purple's new too, isn't it? I haven't seen the purple before. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. I don't know. What else is there to say about the watch? Renee, you got any other juicy tidbits before we move on? I, it just feels like we were talking about it forever, Leo. I just wanted to arrive now. I know. So we can talk about it some I more. know. I'm done. I have I actually some more. We actually want to, to talk, talk about the estimates on sales because they're very quite wildly. And I'm, I'm curious what you guys uh, think of those. Before we do that, though, let's talk about my clothes. Because you know what? <laughs> it's not just Carl Lagerfeld and Will Carlin. And Beyonce that are snazzy. Thanks to Trunk Club, I'm getting more snazzy. Look, guys, I know we all hate to shop, except for gadgets and tools. But when it comes to clothes shopping, it's the worst. That's why I was so happy about Trunk Club. Gals have had solutions like this for years, but now, Trunk Club, guys, you can talk to your a, a personal stylist. Mine is Robin. You can't have her. I talked to Robin for about, uh, I think about half an hour. She was very, it was fun. I was talking about my, you know, and I was, I was, it's like talking to a doctor. You could say, yeah, I'm kind of fat. And she, she doesn't mock me. Yeah, a little chunky and thick around the middle. And uh, we talked about sizes, styles. I said, well, you know, I come from a preppy background. She said, we'll fix that. And, uh, and so forth. And then she goes online and posts a page just for you with some suggestions. And it's like hot or not. You go through them. And you say, I'll never wear that. Oh, yeah, I'll wear that. I like that. No, no, no. Then this is the best part. And by the way, at this point, you have paid zero zip zilch. Nothing. A box comes, a trunk. My first trunk was actually an even bigger trunk. This, <laughs> this is a medium size <laughs> trunk. And in it are beautiful clothes. Now, you still have paid nothing. Nothing for shipping. Nothing for the clothes. You have 10 days to go through the trunk. Look at all the things. Robin picked out some, oh, I love the cable knit sweaters she picked out. This is something I probably would have never bought for myself, but it's so beautiful. It's kind of a, a pea coat, updated pea coat style. And I just, I'm really excited about this. Unstructured, it's soft. I'm learning all these words like that. Uh, shirts, pants, neckties, pocket squares, even shoes. You tr All in your size. Actually, she sent two of these pea coats because she wasn't sure about the sizing exactly. You keep what you want, and you send the rest back. Ten days to decide. And then and only then do you get charged, and only for the stuff you kept. Ship it all back, you still pay nothing. And another thing, there's no monthly subscription, no monthly fees. It You just, whenever you, know, you want more clothes, you call Robin, or whoever your stylist is, and say, it's time for another trunk. And she'll set it up for you. I love this. Trunk Club is a revelation I've already had three trunks because I <laughs> kind of fell in love with it. It's so much fun. Your own personal stylist, a real person who will pick based on your lifestyle, your preferences, whether it's bold, casual, business, formal, she'll get you something you like. Shirts, shoes, slacks, jeans, belts, jackets, really great brands. Once your trunk arrives, you keep what you like. You return the rest free of charge. So it's free to join. Shipping returns free. No minimum purchase, no subscription. It's really simple. You just pay for what you keep. I <laughs> love this idea. If you're busy or maybe you hate shopping like me, make it easy. Rely on your own personal stylist from Trunk Club. Go to trunkclub.com 
slash twit to get started, to meet your stylist, and get your uh, first trunk of fabulous clothes for free. Trunkclub.com slash twit. It's such a great idea. I'm wearing, just, just think if Facebook did Trunk Club. It would be the Zuckerberg model where you just get a T-shirt and a sweatshirt yeah, every month. Yeah. Like, here's a new one. It time, guys, here's it's time to get out of the hoodie and the shower slippers and start wearing something nice. This, this is Trunk Club I'm wearing right now. It's beautiful. Marin I feel like I'm just, it's a new me. Thank you, Trunk Club. Uh, KGI. So I've seen estimates ranging from a million watches in the first weekend to a high, which comes from KGI, of 2.3 million Apple Watch pre-orders. KGI, and I don't know, I want to vet this with you guys. Uh, it says 85% sport, uh, less than 1% addition. The run rate, two to three million per month. This is Ming-Chi Kuo. Mm -hmm. Who is I think has a Renee is he's he has the most, a yeah fairly he's pretty, good he's, yeah I think he's the most reliable of the financial analysts but I think also the million number was just U S and I think Mickey ah. Close doing international but I'm not positive well this this is I mean good lord <laughs> it's a lot of watch and the addition is really low because I guess Apple keeps giving them away <laughs> <laughs> they, no look at that price ten thousand dollars and up no you know one percent that I think if yeah. you got one percent you'd be happy of a three million. There was a breakdown of how much money uh, based on these estimates, how much money Apple would make per collection, and the addition I think was still second only to the sport, uh, just because it's such it's right. so, so much money so much per markup. watch sold. Yeah. So much markup, yeah. Um, I thought that stainless steel, the middle one, would sell better. I mean, at this, it looks like it's around fourteen or fifteen percent of the total. But it's a it's yeah. a it's a really expensive when you think about it. I mean, yeah, it's I, around six seven hundred bucks. Like right? buying a computer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you know, at that point, six hundred so to fifteen hundred. The one uh, that I got and uh, Don got was oh. six fifty. I don't know what was it in the UK. Six hundred fifty US dollars. Uh, I can't remember now. I'll look it up. Is there a big it's, markup? Because uh, they often do that. They do that to uh, Canadians yeah. and. Europeans. Well, they add VAT. In the, the VAT is included in the price. In the yeah, right. we, we have that. Yeah. aren't in the right. US. And the VAT's steep. Twenty mm percent. -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Golly. So it's a um, we have 15.5% here. Chimney Christmas. But you guys get health care. <laughs> uh, the run rate of two or three. Now, see, this is a really an interesting question because I do think that it, it, you could make the case that, yeah, sure, it's going to sell really well at first. Huge pent-up demand. The most avid Apple aficionados, and there are certainly millions of those, will buy right away. But I think it's also conceivable that the sales could drop maybe even precipitously in the subsequent months as people get get it and say, well, it's cool, but not great, or maybe not great at all. Or I think it's insulated well, I, a little bit because Apple only counts uh, the sale when it ships, I believe, and right. they won't be shipping until May, June, July. So ah, several months to accrue to good point. sales. Good point. So maybe. That, yeah. No, that's an excellent point. Um, I mean, the the I problem is that, that we're that not going to find out what... Sorry, Alex. The, all I'm say is I think that the proof is obviously going to be in the actual quality of the product. So that is going to be the thing that, you know, the, the you can sell, I think Apple can sell 5 million, 6 million of these just from people who are excited about the, the possibility. Yeah. And then after that, it really depends on, you know, whether it's actually a utility, you know, a utility to people's lives. So this and quarter will be great. The summer. It'll be the next quarter that'll be the test. Right. And the good thing for them is they're going right into Christmas. Go ahead. Jim Dobbin had a good he had a good metric. He did a post on Loop uh, where he said that he doesn't really care about sales numbers, about customers that numbers. He just wants to know how many people are still wearing them a week later, a month right. later, three months later, mm -hmm. six months later. Right, and that you can verify just by looking. Mm -hmm. Will I be and wearing that, mine in uh, September? Will you be wearing yours in September? The you know I, I far prefer Android as I've made very clear. I'm sorry <laughs> to uh, uh, as from a phone point of view. But will the watch be enough to keep me on iOS? I mean, I, I like iOS perfectly well. It's not like I loathe iOS. Um, but I will miss some features of Android, I admit. Hey, I saw an interesting thing, and I didn't know this. Maybe, Alex, you knew it. The way Android's designed, there is a roughly guaranteed 10 millisecond audio latency. And maybe much more in Android. And that's one of the reasons you see so few music performance apps on Android tablets. 
you wouldn't they uh, this is from superpower.com they call it android's 10 millisecond problem and uh and i had not heard of this before but it does explain something i mean you they say it's, it's like uh, dragging the beat like in whiplash not not my tempo <laughs> uh and so if you were trying to perform in a band with ios devices and you were using android you'd be off about half a beat does that make sense i, have, I haven't heard that but I, I can definitely see that that would be a that would definitely be an issue um but you know 10 milliseconds is is very very small amount of time so i mean a frame of video is is 30 milliseconds right so this is a third of a frame but but in music it would definitely if you were trying to use it in performance Could use it in live performance be a huge issue. and the yeah. latency might even be greater that's you know that's kind of your base to be well, honest with you i'd be surprised i i i I would think that even the iPhone would have 10 milliseconds of delay. So it, right. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that it, it's, a, it's truly zero latency. That's According a, to Superpowered, like most Android apps have more than 100 milliseconds of audio output late, latency, and the round trip is 200 milliseconds or a fifth of a second. Um, yeah. that, that would be a fifth of a second. That would is be significant in, that's a in terms of musicianship yeah. and yeah. playing music. And, 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 that's, and that's really like what you would expect from a, tele, a telephone call or a go-to-meeting or, or right. anything like that. Those are about 200, uh, 200 milliseconds. If you're ever in the same room as someone you're talking to on the phone, yeah. you get kind of a sense of how long that round trip is. And that, that, that stays pretty constant across most devices. It's one of the reasons why it's difficult to do uh, these uh, duets over the Internet, you know, when you have, <laughs> uh, you know, Tony Bennett in one studio and... Uh, and Lady Gaga across the country and another, they it's hard to do that, but they have solved that. I mean, they've got, I think uh, ISDN it's, and other uh, techniques have gotten latency down to 10 to 20 Optical fiber. And optical, yeah, fiber. optical fiber yeah. is, is really the way to do it. And even then you're still losing, uh, I think it's typically, the, well, what they'll tell you is about, uh, you know, five milliseconds per 100 miles. Um, I think there's ways to get it down to about 200, two milliseconds per 100 miles, but it's still, you know, it's that's about the kind of latency you're going to see. So it is still challenging, though we, we've done some stuff even over Hangouts that that have been across, uh, actually, Canada, <laughs> not, not the United <laughs> States. But, um, but well, that's a lot more across careful. in Canada than there is in the U.S. Right, but but your, what we didn't do, we, we kind of talked the folks we were working with out of was... Uh, trying to actually harmonize that's really where things become Ooh, like if you're doing yeah. so what you can do is send and receive so have someone do something and then have them you know give right. give a handoff and the other people pick it up that you can do with you know a lot of latency but the actual keeping things in harmony or keeping things to the beat is almost impossible virtually right the one thing that i heard consistently is, uh, from developers was that uh, a lot of people underestimate the coco touch frameworks for example apple has core audio and they have accelerate which is a lot of the math that a lot of music apps use and they get all of that for free so it really cuts down the amount of development work and i don't want to name any names but there are some apps that just don't exist on android because they they just they can't put in the effort to rebuild all that stuff from exactly. scratch and the ones mm -hmm. that do it took them literally a year a year and a half two years to rebuild that to a level that it matched what they got on right. ios basically for free I've heard that many times from developers. Also, animation much easier on yep. iOS. The uh, ba the uh, t you, tools and libraries you're provided with are uh, much easier to use on. You, well, the material design. You guys, I iOS developers, the... is that why you're nodding? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got a couple of people in the studio going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, um, so, you see, we're objective here. We cover it all. If there's something good, something bad, we'll talk about it. And uh, my my issue is much is just much more at a higher level of of uh, UI, and uh, and I but I think if I don't take my iPhone out of the pocket, if I like the UI on the watch, that may solve it all, right? We'll it's see. interesting that, that a couple of people who aren't sort of Apple aficionados that I've spoken to, who are interested in the watch, are are interested for that very reason um, that they want to they they have jobs where they can't easily take the phone out, right? And they would like access to the phone's features from the watch so that they can just to sort of glance at it and, and check things. And um, I was quite surprised, really, because there were two people that I thought probably, you know, it wasn't even on their radar, but they were, uh, they're, they're well up for it, yeah. You know what I'm really interested in? I just, they sent me a few, so I, uh, just kind of out of the blue, uh, a thing called Sky Bell, which is a doorbell, and I actually installed it at home, that has, a, it has a camera on it, and it's Wi-Fi enabled. So one of the problems we had is, uh, we, I, our doorbell's so funky. People ring the bell, and I don't hear it. We're busy. We're in the other room. So this will ring the, when you ring the doorbell. Rings all my devices, Android and iOS, are all going off. And then you can press a button and talk back to the person at the door and see a picture, even if you're here. If I'm at work, but they uh, apparently they're going to have an Apple Watch interface for the iOS version, 
which means I'll be finally be able to answer the door for my watch. Won't that be interesting? Very Dick Tracy. Every kid's dream. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a cool idea? It'd be nice if there was a camera in as well. You know, eventually so there is a camera. Shocks, they can't see water. me, but I can see them. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Not it's two hundred bucks and it's a little wonky, but it, but because uh, somebody called the radio show and said I can't get it working, so I guess they heard that and they sent me some and I installed it and it works great. I could turn on the camera right now actually, and and see you know what's going on out my front door. The angry mailman. Yeah. Hey. Well, that's the funny thing because FedEx and the mailman do ring the front door, Bill, and so I do get no, like a ding dong. <laughs> I know you're in there, Laporte. I know you're in there. Let's see if I can see uh, what's going on. Uh, out front uh, of my house, nothing, nothing right now, but there it is. And I can say, hey, what you doing? Hey, get away from there. <laughs> Poor cat. Poor cat. Isn't that funny? That's the, that's the actual live picture from my front door. So that's kind of cool. And I love the idea that I could do that on my watch. Would I? The watch can't do like a live video feed, though. They show, yeah, they showed it at the event um, using, I forget the name of the app. Oh, the Alarm garage Force. door. Yeah, the garage door. Isn't that neat? It's not live video. Only, as far as I know, the native apps, like if you use the phone, uh, there's a, a remote shutter for the phone where you can see through the viewfinder of your iPhone and then take pictures remotely with the watch. That's real-time video. What I think the third-party watch kit extensions are doing is throwing, again, throwing PNG files at a, as high a frame rate as they can. Oh, that's interesting. So low frame rate, but, but you at least yeah. see something. Yeah, I don't know what the frame rate is. Nobody's moving. Which could be um, scary if it looks like a zombie coming at you. Well, and I could take a picture of it <laughs> if there's a zombie. <laughs> I think we're really entering an interesting era of connectivity with this Internet of Things stuff. Anyway, this is called Skybell. It's a couple of hundred bucks. I'll do a full review at some point on Before You Buy. Uh, we Did you talk last week about the, the memo, the uh, Aaron's memo, saying we're not going to put watches in the store, so forget about it? Yeah. That seems sensible because there's so many SKUs on this. It's kind of an unusual product for Apple. Well, I think if they had just an, an enormous supply and right. they had a really good idea of what the demand curve would be for each separate model, they, it would be easier for them to stock it. But uh, this this seems like the best of a of a yeah. strained supply constrained situation. And then at some point, as she says, until June or but at some point, mm -hmm. you're exactly right. They'll have enough s supply and they'll have data points to know. You know, it's like McDonald's. How many Big Macs you're going to make? How many uh, how many regulars you're going to make? You just you know after a while. Well, apparently there was some concern that people would line up and they'd be spending like six, eight hours in line and they'd get there and they'd say, I want the stainless Sorry. steel Milanese. Don't have all, it. Sorry, all we have is the pink sport left. And then people <laughs> would buy stuff they weren't happy with. And That happened to me when they, with the iPhone that. 6. I got the yeah. equivalent of the pink sport iPhone 6. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other problem as well is if people turn up at the store to buy these things is that, you know, because it is a very personal thing and you, if, if people have it in their mind, right, I'm going to buy the 42 Milanese and they go in, they try it on and say, oh, actually, no, can I try another one because I don't like this. So, you know, you end up with people going through the entire range of uh, straps and watches yeah. to actually buy it there. So I think that they've tackled it probably as best they could to, you know, do the pre-orders online and and go in for an appointment. So people, I know people have actually gone in, tried it on and actually changed their mind and reordered it at that point. So and it's yeah. a bit My mom did. easy My mom to do that. the bigger one. Did she? Yeah, I'm yeah, afraid. I, I th th I'm afraid the little one's going to be too little for me. So how many SKUs are there? There's uh, in, in, in aluminum, there's just one, right? Well, Not bands. Each, stra yeah, each strap is considered a separate SKU because you buy them as a paired unit. Okay. But let's, let's not, okay, that's bad. So let's take the straps off. In the aluminum, there's 38 and 42. In the yeah, stainless, there's and, four and, because there's 38 and 42 for silver and black, right? Yeah, same in aluminum because there's silver same and there's also space gray. Oh, there's space gray. Yeah. So there's 12 SKUs then because there's four in each. So there's yes. 12 different kinds of watches and then a lot of different kinds of bands. So yeah. I can see how keeping that all stocked up would be difficult. One it's thing my mom, my, my mom did her try on last week, and she was really impressed with the accessibility of the straps because she's older now, and she says she has a lot of trouble with some jewelry putting the straps yes. on and off. And she found a lot of the Apple bands, really, as soon as they told her how to use it, really easy and really accessible for Which her. Which one do. did she like uh, for accessibility? Or she liked, uh, she especially liked the loops. And I think yeah. I've made a joke that the loops are essentially the Lululemon pants of... Uh, of <laughs> That's of why I bought them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But even the even the bracelets, she had an easy time because the modern uh, buckle, it looks like a buckle, but it's actually magnetic. It's ah. two parts that magnetically adhere together and that makes it really easy ah. to, to put it together. Okay. Apple has talked about the, de the technology and functionality behind Apple's uh, heart rate 
monitor. This is in a new uh, support page um, at support.apple.com. It's HT204666. Mm, the mark of the watch. Your heart rate, what it means, and where on Apple Watch you'll find it. It describes how it measures it. Those are four little uh, uh, sensors on the back. You've see, we've probably all seen those. Um, so it uses infrared light to measure your heart rate every 10 minutes. So it's not continuous. Uh, if the infrared system isn't providing an adequate reading, it switches to green LEDs. In addition, the heart rate sensor is designed to compensate for low signal levels by increasing both brightness and sampling rate. So you can see how it's going to be hard to say what your battery life is. If you have, uh, you know, thick skin, it might be worse battery life. I think also when you're doing the workout app, it takes much more frequent readouts sure. so it can give you more accurate. The uh, technique is something called photoplethysmography. Um, say that 10 times. Photoplethysmography. <laughs> Blood is oh, red. Yes, it reflects red light and absorbs green light. So the green LEDs paired with light-sensitive photodiodes, that's the uh, the other two dots, um, will detect the amount of blood flowing through your wrist at any given moment. So as your heart beats, the blood flows, the green light absorption goes up, and then it goes down. Up, down, right? So by measuring the difference, it can actually count uh, your heart beats. By flashing the LED lights hundreds of times per second, it calculates the number of times the heart beats each minute your heart rate. The fit is important, of course. If your Apple Watch doesn't stay in place or sensors aren't reading your heart rate, tighten the band a bit. It should be snug but comfortable. In other words, it needs to make contact with your skin, I think, there. A lot of people wear wristwatches a little loose so they kind of wobble. You may not like that. But for sport activity, you're going to want to tighten it anyway. Yeah, right. Otherwise, it might annoy exactly. you. I think but it I was like the idea of it measuring it throughout the day, not just when I'm working out, but throughout the day. I love that idea. Wish it could do blood pressure throughout the day. Many factors can affect the performance of the heart rate sensor. Skin perfusion is one. A fancy way of describing how much blood flows through your skin. Apparently, skin perfusion varies considerably from person to person. And environment. If you're in the cold, the perfusion may be too low for the heart rate sensor to get a reading. So it's only going to work for you, Renee, in the, in the summer. Like a vampire, the blood retreats from the surface <laughs> levels of our skin. <laughs> Motion is another factor. Rhythmic movements like running or cycling give better results compared to irregular movements like tennis or boxing. Okay, so when I box, I won't wear my Apple Watch. That seems like a good plan. Just got to box regularly. <laughs> <laughs> boom, 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 yeah. boom, 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 boom. Round three. See, I'm, I'm a bit worried with um, with the the fitness tracking for me because um, during the working day I actually use my uh, treadmill, so I have a treadmill desk, and I've always found with the up band, with uh, all the other fitness band I've tried, because it, if I wear it on my wrist, it doesn't actually reflect the number of steps because I'm actually typing at the same time. So I th I'm hoping it's going to work slightly better, but I'm not uh, I'm not 100 percent sure it's going to be completely accurate. Apparently, it is better at, uh, Renee, you were saying this, better at, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, pedometers out there really are walking and running, and that's it. Yes. Yeah, and they if you watch that video again from ABC where they took him into the lab, you see that they did extensive modeling on a fitness equipment, and there's rowing machines and stationary bikes and treadmills and all of those things, and they're using every sensor they have, not just not just the, the the stair climber or the step counter to try and model what you're actually doing. That's what it says oh. here. It says heart rate is just one of the many factors the yeah. Apple Watch uses to measure your activity and exercise. Depending on your workout, it selects... Let me make it a little bit bigger so you can see this on the screen. It selects the most appropriate inputs for that activity. When you're running indoors, it also uses the accelerometer. When you're cycling outdoors, it uses the GPS on your iPhone. Of course, the watch doesn't have GPS. So you'd have to have your iPhone for it to measure that. Yeah. And even when you're not in a dedicated workout, it tracks how much you move each day. That's that neat little thing, uh, the half moon thing. So Apple Watch can give you information and motivation to improve your fitness health. Actually, for that reason alone, I'm very interested in it. I love the idea that I could see, oh, you spend a lot of time sitting, get up. I like that. Yeah. And it'll also measure, and, and it's trying to encourage you, so it doesn't want you to fail, so it'll adjust downwards if you're having a bad week and adjust yeah. upwards again if you're having a good week. And it looks motivationally very sound. It also, and I, and I didn't know this, I hadn't seen this before, it will work with Bluetooth chest straps. Mm -hmm. So uh, many of us use like the Polar uh, watch or the Polar chest straps. It will support that as well. So that's good I think news. that 
I do think that at some point, I mean, this is really the beginning of this, but I think we're going to see a much more tight integration between exercise equipment and a variety of other things with things like the watch. I think the yeah. watch is going to, you know, I'm surprised we didn't see it as much with the phones, but I think that, you know, I think the watch is just perfect to be able to, I mean, I think eventually you're going to walk up to your, to your, uh, you know, lat pull down and it's going to know what you did last time, how many reps, and it's going to tell you how many, you know, what weight to put it on and what, you know, and, and all of that's going to be going back and forth between the machine and the watch. I I, uh, I think the opportunities here are great, but uh, but we've seen that before with Apple, and critical mass is is critical. Getting enough people using it so that makers of equipment will say, "Oh, we should support the watch." Yeah, I don't know if this is for sure, but there there was a rumor that there was only going to be uh, like maybe a hundred or two hundred apps available at launch. The ones that Apple had you know spent a lot of time with the developers on, but given how they've been doing everything and all the stuff that we've been seeing, it looks like there's going to be thousands of apps available. Not everyone is going to want all those apps, of course, but there's a higher likelihood that you'll find those one or two or three apps that really make a huge deal to you. Yeah. And I think that sort of critical mass is part of this because we saw with the App Store and iPhone 3G, when that happened, all of a sudden it was super monkey ball for one person. It was a Facebook <laughs> phone for somebody else, a Twitter phone for somebody else. Right. And it really did change how you wanted to use, how, how sticky that phone became. Uh, Apple's learned a little bit from Jawbone, which had to recall uh, some of its uh, bands because of nickel. Uh, nickel sensitivity. I didn't. I was not sensitized to this issue, but it's a significant issue, and it means a lot of people cannot wear uh, uh, anything on their skin that has a, a significant nickel. Apple, Apple has very been very careful about that. Um, they they have a whole page de dedicated to that as well on the support page. Mm -hmm. Thousands of material composition tests, more than a thousand prototypes worn for trial studies, hundreds of toxicological assessments, consultations with board-certified dermatologists. So if you have allergies or sensitivities, it does say the Apple Watch, Space Gray Apple Watch sports stainless steel portions of some watch bands, and the magnets in the watch and bands do contain nickel, but they all fall below the strict nickel restrictions set by the European REACH regulation. So you will have some nickel exposure, but... The uh, the possibility of nickel related related reactions is very low, and then methacrylates or methacrylates, uh, the Apple Watch case, the Milanese loop, the modern buckle, and the leather loop contain trace amounts of meth methacrylates from uh, adhesives. Um, Band aids have them. Some people have sensitivities. Uh, they do warn people uh, these parts are not in direct contact with your skin, but it is a potential cause. Of discomfort they also say don't wear your watch too tight <laughs> so uh, and also care and cleaning do not put your wash watch in the wash but you could clean it with a cloth that comes with it a lint-free cloth comes with it uh, just as it does with the uh, laptops just not an orange one <laughs> 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 Apple Watch is water resistant. You may dampen the wa the cloth with clean water. They're they're not saying Windex, so don't maybe uh, Apple Watch is splash and water resistant, not waterproof. You can wear and use it during exercise in the rain and while washing your hands. Do not submerge it. The rating for those who are curious, IPX seven. And if you're wearing a leather band, that's probably not a good yeah. idea to get that wet. I can't. I don't. I, I love leather bands, but you know, just from my own sweat, they get kind of funky pretty quick. So that's why I got the Milanese Loop. Yeah. Nice and choice. the magnet that means it fits. You know, exactly right, no matter what. Yeah. It's the stretch you're. pants of watch bands, Leo. It is. It's the Lululemon baby. <laughs> I got. I got yoga pants on my wrist. Yes. Oh, they should use that slogan. <laughs> <laughs> it's yoga pants for your wrist. Ah. Oh. <sighs> Is just happy. All right. I have now, I believe, depleted all possible Apple Watch stories. You agree, guys? Mm. <laughs> we can talk there was about one I saw video. today. There was one I saw another story today about returns for the edition. That returns? they're gonna have a really strict Yeah, they're gonna have a really strict policy and they're going to uh if you take an edition back to the Apple store to return it, they're going to Examine it with microscopes. They're going to weigh it so to make wow. sure none of the gold has been extracted from inside wow. the case. So that you know, so that that was the only other thing. That's I because there are bad people out there who will take the yeah. watch, shave some gold off of it, and bring it back. <laughs> bring it back. <laughs> Do that ten times. You know, for Do that hundred times. Up. <laughs> more likely, I think, much more likely, you the people who would buy, borrow it basically, so they could wear it at a, at a, at a, yeah. a soiree. 
And I think that's what Beyonce did. And then bring it back. Pretty <laughs> sure Beyonce did that. No, just kidding. All right. Um, we haven't... CR1 says, wait a minute, guys. You can't stop. We haven't talked about the box it comes in yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Ah! So, I again, I'm hoping that we'll have something to unbox on Friday. I hope Apple... I mean, I can't say that it lives up to its promise because they said all they promised was April 24th through May 8th. Fingers crossed, Leo. I have really got my fingers and toes crossed. I, you know, I mean, of course, this is, it's so sad. It's a pathetic statement about me and our society. Three days after it comes, they'll be saying, what's next? Yep. Now what? True. What else am I waiting for? Our show today brought to you by our friends at Smart Things. You don't have to wait to smarten your home. Smart Things makes it easy. And this is actually, uh, I feel like this was, you know, sometimes I talk about, I don't know, flying cars or smart watches. But really, to me, the future began when you could actually make your home a smart home without becoming, you know, being an ultra geek. And I've tried for years to do this. Smart Things solved it. In fact, this was a Kickstarter project uh, that was very exciting. The idea was... Instead of having a different app for your lights, your music, your locks, for everything that you've got in your house, one app on your iPhone or Android device talks to the SmartThings hub, and then the SmartThings hub talks to everything else. And they've really done a marvelous job, not only of supporting most of the other products in the market, but of making their own devices like the Smart Power Outlet, the Smart Sense Motion so this could turn on your lights when you uh, arrive home. Uh, or if you're not home and there's motion, you could say what's going on in there. Smart Things also has sec home security kits, including cameras, so you can look inside. The Smart Sense, um, uh, what else do we have here? There's moisture sensors. This is kind of cool. This is the traditional open and closed window sensor, the two-piece sensor. But it also, while it's doing that, measures the temperature. So you can know when windows or doors or cabinets are open, but it also can tell you what temperature it is. This The presence sensor, this is a little dongle you can put in your keys, or better yet, put in your kid's backpack so you know where you're, when your kids get home or when they leave home. Just some really cool stuff. So these are the SmartThings devices, the SmartThings hub. And if you go to smartthings.com slash twit, you could take a look at their home security and solution kits. They start at $189. And we're going to get you 10% off, plus free shipping in the U.S., if you use the offer code TWIT, this thing, the, I, I'm just so thrilled to see this. Every year I would go to CES and look at the home automation pavilion and be disappointed because it was a tower of Babel. Smart things cut through, cuts through all that. And I guess that kind of explains why they won the CES 2015 Editor's Choice Award. This is a great product that solves a real need. I want you to try it for water detection, energy savings, security, home automation. There's nothing better. And it works with everything else. Smart Things, you can see actually on the, on the website, smartthings.com slash twit. Um, you can see there what devices it works with. Make sure it'll work with yours. Smartthings.com slash twit. And don't forget to use the offer code twit when you uh, buy. Uh, any home security or solution kit, you'll get 10% off and free shipping. It's just smart. Smartthings.com slash twit. We love it. I think this is interesting. You know, Samsung's been sourcing the chips for the uh, iPhone and iPad now for some time. We'd heard rumors that Apple was looking at another foundry. In fact, uh, according to uh, Apple Insider, has made a sudden last-minute decision to source 30% of the next generation A9 chips from this second foundry. T is it TM TSMC? 30% yeah. of the That's the one that made the A9, the A8. They w oh, they did make the A8. Yeah. So, um, am, do I have Samsung chips in my phone, or right now, you, if you have an iPhone six, you have TMSC. Chips. Oh, interesting. But there was some reports that because Samsung has limited capacity, like any fab, they don't have an abundance right. of capacity that because they're busy fabbing all the Exynos chipsets that they might Apple might need to right. hedge and have a second supplier for. Yeah, their Galaxy uh, for screens and their Galaxy Edge uses Exynos. Not uh, they've always used in their Galaxy phones Exynos in Europe and Asia. Uh, but the U.S. has always had Qualcomm chips. This is for the first time ever, the uh, Edge has an Exynos chip globally. Although it still has the Qualcomm baseband for, has especially to. for Verizon. Yeah, for Verizon. Yeah, for Verizon, for CDMA. And that wonderful little sticker that they're forced to put on the Verizon version. Oh, really? 
Yeah, there's a, there's a powered by Qualcomm. It's like an Intel inside oh, yeah, 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 Qualcomm yeah. on the bottom of the yeah. Verizon version. Jason, you just got the S6 normal. I have the Edge. Yeah, I'm loving it. Um, it's a pretty fantastic phone. Now, we should say Jason's the enemy. He works for all about Android. The enemy. Come on. <laughs> He's Come a frenemy on. at best. Frenemy. Okay. <laughs> adversary. <laughs> yeah, Friendly I mean, adversary. So I'm, the only question, the question I have, and maybe Jason answered, I, I, I was using one for two days uh, early, earlier last week, and I turned it sideways, and none of the ports are aligned, and I can't unsee that. Like the, the SIM card thing is not aligned with the buttons. It, like the, the mic knob is not, the mic hole is not aligned with the micro USB port. Oh, you're mm. just weird. Yeah, I, I, I look at these things and I'm like, how hard is that to do? Just do that for me, please. Wait a minute, you want to, oh, look at it. Are they aligned? My, uh, so you're saying, because here on this beautiful Apple iPhone, everything is, is see here. like rigidly aligned, but you're saying yeah. on, huh. Yeah, the camera's pulled out. Now that you've far. told me this, I probably won't be able to unsee it. Okay, so that's the iPhone. They're all in line. They're all in a straight line. Same thing here. Straight yeah, I mean, line. Yeah. I mean, I guess so. <laughs> I guess I never noticed it before. But pull zooming in, you. Oh, can kind of now see. I'm not going to be able to it's unsee hello. it. Oh, I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! Above. <laughs> not a reason to reject the phone, but you're no, you make but an excellent. I'd like point. them to do it. Uh, the infrared sensor is above. Yeah, that's exactly I, what is Apple is like obsessive, like yeah, OCD that's that's obsessive really good point. about stuff. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I guess I didn't look at the alignment. Well, now of the different we, we have to look. Renee, thanks, thank no, you, when Renee. The, when the next one, when the Galaxy S7 is perfectly aligned, they can thank Mac Break Weekly. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty funny. Um, the camera. I, I just have to say the camera. Finally, finally, I use an Android phone, and I'm amazed by the it's camera. It's the first really it's good taken Android. Five camera. years for yeah. of Android devices. For me to finally be super uh, impressed by a camera. Excellent right. review at a non-tech. Very thorough uh, review uh, at a non-tech. And uh, he did say that he still considers the iPhone camera marginally better, probably because it's only 8 megapixels. He does point out that on the edge, when you have a 16 megapixel camera with a sensor that size, that means the pixels uh, on the sensor are about a micron, which is pretty darn small. Mm. They chop um, them up really small to yeah. get the megapixels. And so, uh, you know, maybe he's a little over... Uh, uh, like you, a little over involved in the stats, but well, I don't, uh, so for me, a, a camera on a phone should just be like most people. Most of the time, should be able to pull it out of their pocket and, with absolutely no adjustment, take a photograph. And the edge that, does that. A that. Good memory. I mean, this yeah, S6 the, does yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so I would, that to me is the only criteria. And I use a, I use, a, <laughs> I use a highly subjective criterion for pictures that I call pleasingness. Yes, because uh, I, you know, and and admittedly, sometimes a, a picture that's not perfectly accurate is more pleasing than a picture that is perfectly accurate. In fact, often and some people like warmer, some people like cooler. Yeah. It's very personal sometimes. And I've always thought the iPhone, uh, particularly the iPhone six and six plus, even more so, mm. had a very high pleasingness factor. I mean, you just, you just like you looked at the image and you liked them. You said, "Yeah, that's what I saw. That's Alex how it thinks felt." We're animals right now. He thinks we're absolute animals right now. Who does? Alex. <laughs> you <No>. animal, you! <laughs> no, I, 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 I shoot ninety-five percent of my photos with my iPhone. Yeah. I, mean, I don't. I really take my SLR out, DSLR out, very, uh, very rarely. I mean, yeah. I take it out for very specific things, and sometimes, you know, a couple times a year, I capture things with my kids that I want in that that format. Um, but but really, the thing that I shoot almost exclusively is my iPhone. You know, it, it's the thing that's in my pocket, my DSLR, and even. Micro Four Thirds. I tried to go to that. There is so little room in my case, you know, my my bags that I travel, that anything more than about that size yeah. uh, is, is is a problem for me. And so, so I've gotten I've gotten quite used to it, and I've gotten pretty good at taking those photos. But that and my little three sixty data or whatever are pretty much the only cameras that I have most of the time. It's amazing now that, and in fact, I think in many ways your your smartphone is is uh, primary function is your is, is your camera. At least I think another big area, it's, though, people use it statistically. It is the primary function yeah. of your camera. Is I mean, of your phone is is a camera. And I think that one of the things that you know the integration, like my kids love the fact that that my Apple TV is is connected to my photo stream. So I'm just like constantly taking photos, and they love that that they come home and they see wherever I was. <laughs> you know, that's, that's awesome. You know, there's just things just appearing all the time. You know. Uh, uh, of, of whatever I'm doing, they and they 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 stay connected, and I think it's, uh, that's actually a piece of what I like about about it. I think with DSLRs, then I have to figure out where to put it and yeah. you know, do all this other stuff. With this, I just just online, it's on my computer, it's on everything I need needed to be on. I don't have to think about it.
What were you and saying, Apple Don? Links. No, I was I was going to say exactly the same thing. That, that yeah, the, the the photos are great and the images are fine, but the convenience of yeah. uh, you know the, the the connectivity that they have, and also geolocation. I mean, if you think back a couple of years, how hard it was to actually do geolocation uh, and put that information on Do your photos. You know, when we were in China... It's just done. I was carrying with me... John and I went to uh, China on a, one of the geek cruises, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I was carrying a GPS dongle that with A little me. dongle. That's right. I had one as and, well. and you'd have to... And, I mean, it was just crazy. And then you'd get mm. home, and you'd use a tool. I think it was from Huda that would... Yeah, Huda Geo. Take the K, yeah, Huda Geo would mm -hmm. take the KML file from the GPS dongle and match it because you had to have the time right, and then it would match them, and then they were geolocated. And now it's just, yeah, it's, it's all just geolocated. And I, I noticed with photos because, um, I mean, I've started to use a, a little mirrorless camera as well, and, which is great for travel, and you know, it's nice images, but, you know, there's no geolocation on there, and with the new photos, you can't actually get that information in in, in photos, you have to use something like Hoda Geo to actually put the, um, the the geolocation information on, and it's it's such a pain. In the butt. Mm. Well, and, and, and I think I, I love the, the iPhoto map or the photo map, you know, and, and where the mm -hmm. fact, it, it, you know, I have to admit, sometimes I fall a little behind. I didn't realize I could just search by location, you know, and, and until a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, oh, my gosh. If do I just we have, does the new photos do that? Or is it? Yeah. They didn't. Yep. Okay, good. And so you can sit there and go and, and go, I just want to show you all the pictures from Rwanda or if I'm looking Neat. for pictures from my house, I just I just go to those. And that map is is this great map of, for me, it's just, it's this great memory trip of all these different places that I've, you know, traveled. And, and I love the fact that everything's just getting tagged and everything else, except, except when I post it and I worry about. <laughs> We're all the, using, the, we've the, all we've the, all replaced, if you've updated iOS to 8.3 and you've updated uh, Yosemite to 10103. Bye bye, iPhoto. Hello, photos. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been talking a lot about that, but now it's real for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, what do we think? Uh, I, I mean, I love it. I love it, especially with iCloud Photo Library, because it really yeah. does deliver on that like near line storage promise where all my frequently accessed favorites and recent photos are available on every single one of my devices, my less frequently. Uh, you know, unfavorite photos are just stored up in the cloud and I can get them with a tap of an iCloud button. And it means that I don't, I don't have to worry. My entire library is available everywhere. I do download one copy. Like I have one Mac, my iMac downloads everything and backs it up to time machine just in, you know, in case Apple servers ever explode. But uh, I, 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 it's working great for me. I've been using it for two or three months now. And mm -hmm. we put up, I think, 50 help articles, three guides and a bunch of reviews. And it's just been Really good People so have been complaining uh, that the iCloud photo library sync never completes. It now, takes course, a while, especially with a big it library. It takes a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, and do you recommend when you... Now, obviously, when you're on a phone, you're going to have optimized the iPhone storage because then it downloads... It doesn't download the full originals of everything. It, it, it does some very smart stuff so that you don't fill up your iPhone with photos, but you get access to all your photos. Do you recommend that on the Mac as well? Uh, with a small SSD drive, absolutely, like yeah. a MacBook Air or one of the new MacBooks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because those will fill up really quick. They do a really good job of stopping before you get completely full on your drive. But with the optimized storage, it you, oftentimes you don't need, especially the, all the raw information all available all the time. So it'll just leave that in the cloud until you want it. And if you want to make sure that certain photos are highly available, just you know open them before you go out or favorite them or do something that, that prompts the system. Think of it like a fusion drive. Whatever you do more frequently is going to end up right there on the computer for you. How, okay. So the, by the way, there's somebody in the chat room saying, no photos doesn't do maps. It isn't obvious. There's not, you know, in the yeah. new photos, you have photos, shared, albums, and projects tabs. But if you're in the photos uh, tab, you'll see that they are geolocated. And if you click the geolocation of any given group, it will launch a map. Mm -hmm. and, and that map you can move around in, right, and see where other photos are and so forth. Yeah. I mean, I've been playing a lot with photos this week because it's, it's actually the topic of, of this week's show. So, oh, good. Uh, I'm very, uh, very, very intimated with it at the minute. But no, I, I like it. I mean, there, there are some of the advanced tools that aren't there in Aperture. And yeah. I don't think that the majority of people are really going to miss them. Um, if you're really heavily into photography and you like using the brushes, et cetera, 
you know, it's it's going to be difficult get for you. But just get Lightroom. But yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if you want to do that, get Lightroom. But yeah. but again, my my take on on photos is it is still a version one product. Um, as Rene says, the iCloud Photo Library just is the answer to all my prayers of of workflow because I used to get in such a mess before with having the iPad and the iPhone, and mm -hmm. um, you know, you'd edit something on one device and then that edit version would remain on there, and then you know, it, it was a complete mess. But with iCloud Photo Library, you know, things do sync eventually when you give it time if you've got a big library, and it's just such a a delight to you know edit something on your iPad and then literally within seconds you know it's actually on your Mac or it's on it's on your iPhone as well the edited version right. plus it's non-destructive so you can if you want to revert you can revert as well but but I think that you know it's a version one product they're going down the same route that they did with Final Cut they're going down the same route that they did with Pages and Numbers in that they've um, basically started again from scratch and they've built the architecture underneath and they've produce this first version. Uh, they haven't opened any of the APIs yet so that there's no plugins on the Mac, etc. but I'm sure that's to come. And I'm sure we'll see lots of these more advanced features in Aperture uh, that we had uh, reappear within Photos for those people who want to use it. But as a version one product, it's probably more than suitable for, you know, over 80% of, of people who, who like to play with Photos. I hadn't yet installed, uh, turned it on, on because uh, I just upgraded this laptop to 10.10.3. And it's so cool because you as soon as you turn on iCloud, Photo library, all these images from, you know, way back when uh, are now available to me. I mean, here's pictures from my, our visit to London in the fall, in October. And you get a ton of space back on your device. Yeah. And a lot of people were running out of space. And the, other, the thing to Don's point is there's no photo extensions for OS 10 yet. Those are only iOS, but it's not hard to imagine that that's next yeah. on the list for OS 10. Uh, and, you know, there's a new version of, of Lightroom that's available today. And, you know, there's a lot of features for photographers. But for somebody who just wants to manage all their stuff and not have to worry about it, the feature set, it's it's complete-ish. Uh, it's, it's, there's not everything here, but there's a lot of stuff you can do. Yeah. It ta it's it ta not, not all completely discoverable like that Maps thing. It takes a little time to yeah. kind of move around with it. It also does video, which is nice. Um yeah, I, I think this is a good. I think this is a good uh, middle ground, and the and the iCloud Photo Library. Have you heard of syncing issues, or is it just that people have so many images? It just there are some. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I had a problem today and, and someone asked, because I put out a, a thing on Twitter asking people what would they like to, for me to cover and someone did mention syncing and people are finding they are having uh, gaps in the cache, you know, so that when you yeah. see the thumbnails, they're like sort of spaces sometimes that don't completely fill it's in. A little, it's a little image with a cloud in it, but no image itself. Yeah. Well, I, I sometimes see a few if, of these. If you, actually, if you drill down, uh, normally you see at the top level, you'll see blanks. Yeah. Um, but normally when you drill down to that level, if you give it a few minutes, it normally, and that, that looks like that's uh, that's actually an error. That's probably a video that's not supported. Okay. Yeah. I've seen quite um, a few of these, however. Uh, so, yeah, there's something, so... But I, but yeah, I just but started only, syncing when we started talking about it, so yeah. I'm pretty impressed at the at the range of stuff that's already one of the, been downloaded. One of the really cool things is that there's PhotoKit, which developers can plug into. So, for example, Google updated Snapseed last week, and I love Snapseed, and they they use PhotoKit, so that that fits right into the non-destructive editing pipeline. So anything right. you do with with um, Snapseed now it gets preserved in Photos, and you can go back and undo it. And if more apps start doing that, then it becomes really sort of exciting because you don't just have plugins, but you have I'd plugins that. that are non-destructive, that sync, that do all that as well. I'd love that, yeah. Yeah, the, the other thing that people are a little bit concerned about is having to pay for the cloud storage because obviously if you're just using a free 5 gig account, it's not going to sort of hold a lot of photos. So they've they've got tiers that you can um, boost the storage. But, you know, if you don't want that, they, they have given you a sort of get out as well in that you can have multiple photos libraries and because it's only the one library on your mac that will actually synchronize with the icloud photo library so you can assign ah. one library to sync and then have other libraries you know for archive or if it's just stuff that you don't want to sync between your devices you can hold that in separate libraries as well oh that's so, nice uh, yeah so you can do it. it's a bit difficult to move photos from one library to another at the moment okay but, you know you, you can keep them in separate libraries and then just switch use the old trick of uh, hold down the alter option key when you load photos and that will allow, allow you to select that's the library very that good to know open. so if you're going to import stuff that you don't want to put on iCloud for instance uh you could do that hold down the alt key when you launch yeah. photos and say yeah. create a new one mm -hmm. and you'll have now or if, you, if you've got 
you know, if you've got a huge aperture library like I did, my aperture library contained hundreds of 4K video clips, which, you know, are huge in size. And I don't really, I'm going to use them to, to edit and make a, you know, a smaller movie. So I didn't really want all those clips to be uh, uploaded. So I basically, before I migrated my aperture library, just exported all those 4K clips into you know, a separate partition, deleted them from the aperture library and then just migrated my aperture library. And it was a lot smaller by the time I'd done that, you know. So there are ways you can you can massage and manipulate what actually does get uploaded to iCloud Photo. Jason Snell writes an article uh, a couple of weeks ago in SixColors.com uh, about an experience that was a little odd. Now, he has 20,000 uh, photos in a family photo collection. And it started upload. He says, last, later that day I discovered something. The next day, my internet connection seemed to die or at least become sporadically inert. Traffic would sometimes squirt through, but after long days, long delays, it was weird and intermittent, and I was really sad, as I would be as well. <laughs> Later that day, I discovered something, though. Even though iPhotos wasn't open, a background task was uploading my photo library to iCloud, all 20,000 photos. This process was using all available bandwidth. It was what, not what we call nice. Saturating my outbound internet connection, which means your downloads will also be uh, throttled. If you're trying out photos and wondering why your internet is suddenly slow, now you know you can pause for one day. That's a button right there in the settings for iCloud Photo Library. Um, are you aware of this, Renee? Have you seen this? Yeah, there was a big debate about whether it was uploading in the background or not. And different. And Jason was showing, you know, screenshots of network activity to prove that it really was. Mm. Um, and again, like it, this even is, if you know, photos really is closed. Yeah, um, yeah you, have, an you agent, have to pause it? it. Yeah, it's a, a demon or an agent. I, I forget the technical term. Mm. The thing is, though, that button, although it says pause for a day, you can actually just pause it and it turns into a resume button. So if you just want to pause it for a couple of hours, you can you can press that. And then, right. you know, if, if you're working during the day, just press that and then leave it on overnight and just press I, resume. I presume and it'll once it's on. done, it'll be, you know, done. Yeah. But that's bad programming. It should be, yeah, uh, you know, when you have really. Backblazer, Carbonite, our sponsor, <laughs> people like that. Even iTunes. They'll, they'll be careful about using your yeah. upstream. Uh, I'll give you the option to toggle it, you know, or to right. a slider to, you know, change so the get, amount of get bandwidth. Get it done. That it get her done. Yeah. 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 And Carbonite. you have to be very careful if, you're, if, if you accidentally have a MiFi that it accidentally uh, connects yeah. to it. <laughs> if you had a bandwidth cap, experience. you should yeah. uh, be aware Or no, you want a bandwidth cap. What you don't want is to have a limit where you're then paying $10 a gig after right. that. Just, just in case <laughs> right. you're wondering, it, it adds up over time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> This is actually a, a problem a lot of uh, a lot of programs have, and something uh, something new with this cloud storage thing. Uh, but just uh, good to be aware of. It still amazes me that um, I mean Apple have always suffered with a bad press on on cloud and web, and justly so, you know, in in the early days with uh, mobile me etc. But they really do seem to have got their act together now. When you consider the amount of data that they're, they're you know, pushing down or pulling up. When you look at the music, you look at the movies with iTunes, you look at all the apps for the Mac and for the for iOS, and now the iCloud Photo Library. You know, the sheer volume of, of traffic they must be handling now is it's open to the public. It's not just a beta, so anyone now can upload. You know, two hundred gigs of data. I mean, that's where I'm pushing up at the minute. I'm uh, I've converted my aperture library. It's about two hundred and fifty gig. I'm about. I only started it two days ago, and I've been switching it off during the day while I work and just Jeez leaving it on. Please. And about halfway. It's probably probably about a third of the way through, but it's 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 getting up there, you know. And there's no way to say don't uh, don't put this album on the cloud. You just have to open a new, create a new library. Yeah, it's everything within a library goes. Uh, it's called your system photo library. Uh, that's the one that actually gets synced with with iCloud Photo Library. Mm. It's meant to be sort of set it and forget it. It's made so that you can mm -hmm. take the humans out of photo management. They want to do it all yeah. intelligently for you. Which is great if it if what it does is is what you want it to do. Yes. You, it, but as you get more sophisticated, maybe it isn't. It's like Time Machine and a lot of other. Yeah. It's things. exactly like that. Yeah. Apple always errs on the side of you know it's just magic, um, but it, sometimes magic can be black magic for those who. Well, and sometimes have they other as the needs. time goes on, like like now they've added to Time Machine where you can you can prevent it from backing up right. certain folders, and I wouldn't be surprised if that stuff slowly begins to appear in photos over time. And I think they presume correctly in most cases. That if you're that sophisticated, you know, you just disable it and you'll do your own thing. Yep. You'll you'll know what to do. It's you're really using Lightroom. yeah, you'll use or whatever. You'll yeah, exactly. So this is for people who don't know better and will be in ninety nine percent of the case just happy. 
The problem is I wish they would document a little bit better so that we could we the more sophisticated users could say, "Oh, I don't want that. <laughs> I prefer not to have that." Um, on the other hand, I'm loving the fact that uh, for the even though I'm using this machine uh, for the first time with uh, Yosemite 1010 I got all my pictures on here. That's nice. Yeah. Without clogging my hard drive. It's even more amazing on your phone. You just pull out your phone yeah. and that picture from 2007 Isn't that you want to show the grandparents all of a yeah. sudden is right there. Yeah. What do we know what the algorithms are for uh, how much how many originals to put on there, how many thumbnails, you know, uh, they explained it, um, it's, and I'm going to forget it. I'm not going to get it right, but basically they see how much storage space you have left, and if you have optimized storage on, what it'll do is upload the originals and replace them with, with sizes that are optimized for the screen of the device that you're using. Uh, and then any photo that you've taken recently, that you've opened recently, or that you've favorited will get priority for, for caching locally. Anything that's old or you haven't looked at in a long time will be prioritized for cloud storage. So it's, it, it is basically a nearline algorithm. That's a real. I think that's a really good way to do it. Yeah. Very nice. All right. Let's see what yeah. else is uh, going on in the world of. I forgot we for we skipped over. Apple bought the camera company Lynx. Yeah. What is that for? What are they going to do with them? L is it L Y N X? L N L I N capital X. L I. It's an imaging uh, company from Israel. What does Lynx do? Uh, Lynx, I mean, this is marketing hype, but they say they want to make iPhone cameras as good as DSLR cameras, and they're using a bunch of 3D imaging technology to sort uh -huh. of super sample and get depth information and other information to try to boost the quality of small camera technology. They have multiple sensors, in some cases as many as four sensors in a single camera. And this is and this is very similar. I mean, this is a similar technology to Lytro. It's a similar technology mm -hmm. to what Samsung or, or what um, uh, HTC has done with the, with the M8 and M9. Uh, so you know the idea is with a with a little bit of parallax you can you can get a lot right. of information about how far things are away and then you can start selectively grabbing things and, and creating short depth of field. There is all kinds of things you can do with these lenses. I mean that's that that is the simplest <laughs> of, of the things that you can do once you're gathering that information. So there's yeah. um, you know and, and I do think that this is going to be the future. Right now we're seeing a handful of of uh, cameras with this. I wouldn't be surprised if most cameras had this in ten years. Some version of this. This is the press release from Lynx before they got bought. Apple bought, they only paid $20 million. It's cheap. Yeah. Early John on. Gruber rumored this, him, I think. Get them, get them early. Yeah. John Gruber had a rumor, I think, what, six, six months ago that Apple was doing this with their cameras. So well played, John. Yeah. Uh, or well leaked Apple, one or the other. Uh, it would make sense. Uh, the press release uh, from last year uh, and Lynx says, the image quality of mobile cameras has reached a dead end. I think you're seeing this with the with the edge, where you're putting 16 megapixels in, but they're they're micro, sub micron pixels. Device makers are striving to differentiate using imaging capabilities, but the pixel size race has ended, and the next generation cameras do not reveal any dramatic improvements. Lynx camera, it really is. It's about software, you know, right now. But the, this is a hardware innovation that might make a big difference. Lynx cameras revolutionize mobile photography and broaden the usability span and user experience. Allowing us to leave our SLRs at home. Uh, it uses the extra lenses to extract depth information. So you could do 3D image reconstruction. Uh, you could, uh, of course, you know, uh, with depth sensitivity, you can uh, do multiple variable, fo variable focus as the Elytro does. Should be Apple smart. This look, Apple uh, needs to. It, I mean, their ascendancy has for a long time been, and the iPhone has been partially powered by the strength of their f camera. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing as good. And Neil you got to stay ahead because people are starting to catch up now. Neil Seibert had a great article on Above Avalon yesterday about uh, the, the the importance of the camera because it's one of the features that people will upgrade early for. If you can prove, if you can prove the camera substantially better, then maybe 10% more people will upgrade that year. And that translates into a lot of money. It's got to be in the 7, right? Not the 6S. Uh, it's it's hard to yeah. tell. The success will have the same body, but you know they can do a lot with a camera even within the same body. I'd be really surprised to see anything before 2016. Yeah, because you're stuck. I mean, it, rarely. Uh, well, we don't know because Apple. I mean, they could do whatever they want, but the last few generations, the the second iteration of a new design has not modified the body, right? So you still would have this camera, this size camera hole, or could you could you make it a bigger mill a bigger App a hole and change the motherboard significantly. Would that be an S? They have so much money, Leo. I know, they can do anything they want. I mean, they could make the bump a little bigger, couldn't they? Because they've already started to educate us with having a, a yeah. prominence on the outside. So they could actually, you know, stick that up by another millimeter or two. The S6 <laughs> has quite a bump. 
actually. The 5S had Touch ID. I mean, they swapped, they, they added Touch ID, which is a hardware feature to the You're 5S. right. That's a new, that's a new device. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that, I think that the issue is, is I think they're probably in the landing phase of manufacturing already. I mean, if they're you know, oh my God, can you believe that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> of course they're for the next for the next version. But, but for something yeah. in the fall, they're gonna need they they're, they're gonna know that they need, and they'll know down to the million <laughs> of what they need. Right. But, but and they probably have ten or fifteen million that need to be uh, produced minimum. I, I think there's a huge surge in in the six and six S. I don't think. I mean, I'm mean, sorry, the six and uh, six plus. I'm not sure that the surge will be quite the same, you know, for the success, just because there was there was a lot of pent up demand. Okay, uh, kudos to Apple buying up 36,000 acres of forest in partnership with a conservation fund. Uh, Apple does use a little bit of paper, uh, and uh, the land which are in, is in Maine and North Carolina. It's land roughly twice the size of Manhattan. 45 million, part of a 45 million acre uh, private forest in the U.S. that is in danger of being lost due to development. So Apple acquired these and will harvest pulp from these forests for its virgin paper needs. Uh, probably for the boxes. <laughs> I'm sure those are made from virgin paper. Um, but, uh, you know, done properly, wood is a renewable resource. And uh, instead of clear-cutting this forest and putting uh, housing complexes up, the, they will, the trees will stay. They'll harvest them. Um, I mean, if you think about it, uh, when you sell hundreds of millions of devices every year, each in its own perfectly crafted square box, uh, you got a lot of non-recyclable uh, non fiber. They say that about one-third of the paper packaging of the iOS devices is non-recycled fiber. Um, and I think Apple, Apple gets pinched a lot on whether, you know, the environmental impact of, of what they're doing. So I think that, I, I think this is probably just the beginning. This is a, a small step in in the process of, of them taking more control over their supply chain. It, it feels like they're almost getting to a point where they could, I mean, they have the cash to do it if they wanted to, build almost a vertical market where they're literally pulling the I mean, completely vertical, where they're literally pulling um, the content out of the ground. Uh, and this trees is the beginning of this, but it could be, um, you know, rare earth metals, all kinds of other things where they're actually owning a big chunk of that uh, and managing it the way they want to manage it and then having it all, you know, own it all the way to the end. Maybe they'll start making the boxes out of wood. What, what do they need to be paper for? Make them out of wood. You got the wood. <laughs> there you go. Apple's got wood. Now 36,000 acres of wood. I like wooden boxes. We got our Heil mics came in wooden boxes for a long time. Yeah. Um, you're making a, something of that kind of quality. I, do the, does the edition come in a fine? It comes in a, it's got a very fancy box. Yeah. Is it cardboard? I, I don't know. I shouldn't ask what it was made out of. Yeah. But it looks very fancy. Yeah. Fancy box. But anyway, uh, there is a precedent for this. Remember Henry Ford when he built the Rouge factory? which still runs in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, the whole idea was that you put boxcars of trees and and uh, ingots of iron in on one end and a car comes out the other end because they have forges and they have mills and they have everything you need in the Rouge factory, which is a massive factory. Well, and if you look at, I mean, what's now disbanded, I mean, we think of them as, as uh, coffee, coffee makers, but Krupp's really owned everything from the, they were right. Krupp's arms, and they owned everything from the mining organizations that pulled it out of the ground yep. all the way to the finished guns um, that they that they outputted. If you're big enough, it's the way to do it. Uh, all right, a couple of, let's wrap up with a few things. We, we did mention uh, the LA Unified School District's purchase of a large number of iPads, one for each student in the district. Uh, they issued a 30-year bond to pay for it, which seemed on the face of it bad fiscal policy. Uh, the the program was a incredible flop. They're being investigated because the no longer, but at the time, superintendent there had ties to Apple and Pearson, which is the uh, publishing company that uh, made the curriculum to go on these iPads. They bought the curriculum sight unseen. There's complaints now it never worked, and Apple is now saying, App, I mean, uh, L.A. Unified School District is now saying to Apple, we want our money back. We want our money back. I think this is a, a real clear <laughs> when you think about Pearson and you think about putting the putting the content onto iPads this is a classic case of 
uh, new wine and old wine skins. I mean, you know, the 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 issue is is that it's it is a uh, you know they're ha- they have uh, this old technology being books, and I get that they they try to spruce it up with making a couple things interactive, uh, but but really you know for this kind of thing to work for most of these school systems, like to really build your entire curriculum around it, it's going to require a complete rethinking of the education process, and and I don't think I don't think most public schools are are ready for that. $1.3 billion in iPads. It failed almost immediately. It was rolled out in fall 2013. The devices uh, didn't work. Teachers weren't well trained. They often would put the devices aside. I think the, the um, motivation was good, which is uh, there are a lot of poor kids in our district who do not have access to technology, and we want to make sure that they have access to technology, whether an iPad is exactly the right thing. Um, but- well, and, and I think that I think under uh, underlining, I think the teachers didn't jump on it. The teachers didn't take much advantage of it. I think there was a lot of other problems. But if you look at like the Baltimore school district actually put smart boards in every single uh, classroom that they had and almost, you know, all but like one or two of the teachers just used it as a blackboard. They just right. didn't understand it, didn't, you know, and there just wasn't enough training enough, uh, enough for them to see why they should do more work to figure that out. Yeah. Well, it's really as much Pearson's uh, problem as uh, it is Apple's, but the school district said, we're not paying for any more iPads. Thank you very much, and we'd like our money back. I have, it feels like they probably aren't going to have much success with that approach. It's going around snatching iPads from kids' hands. <laughs> Take me that iPad. <laughs> well, humbug. Um, the YouTube app has disappeared from older Apple TV and iOS devices. Wasn't it replaced by a newer, better app? YouTube is apparently changing its data API, and many of those older apps just won't function. If you have an old second generation or earlier Apple TV, the YouTube channel just won't be gone. iPhone, iPad, iPod Touch, iOS 7 or later is required for YouTube uh, to work. So um, that's not an Apple thing. That's 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 a Google thing. They've changed the API. Uh, although Apple, I guess, is responsible for the uh, YouTube app on um, on the Apple TV, at least. It's a channel partnership. So, like, if it's the same as Bloomberg, then they get a kit that lets them develop the app that then ah, gets put on the. I see. I think on the other devices that you can still get to YouTube through mobile Safari, it's just the uh, looks right. like it's the Apple TV browser that's the, works. The one that's going to be right, you know. but there's no browser on the Apple TV. Ten point ten point four. See the developers get ready. Woo! Yep. And eight point four. Woo! What did 8.3 do? What what did I get when I, I I got it last week? What did I get? So 8.2 was all the watch stuff. 8.3 takes all the stuff that Apple's iOS engineers have been working on and mixes that with the watch stuff and gives you like it's basically the next version of iOS. The other one was the same was the same as iOS 8.1 but with the watch stuff. Now you're getting the next version of iOS that combines the watch stuff into it. And you also got the emoji like the 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 diversified emoji with all the flags and and extra things like that. And then iOS 8.4 has been seeded, and according to some websites who've published pictures of it, there's a new music app. Huh. That would be the Beats. There's no Beats yet, but it's a redesigned music app so far. Which might be the front end for things. Front end for something we don't even know what they're going to call. You did mention briefly, we should probably mention Lightroom 6 came out today from Adobe. Have you played with it, Alex? Do you know anything about it? I have not. Um, okay. I, uh, I'll ask more from my sister. I'm going to play with it. I, I'm still figuring out what I'm going to do post aperture. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely looking at it. Um, my, uh, my sister uses uh, Lightroom heavily. So uh, yeah. I'm going to let her give me some guidance. As do I. I think they introduced facial recognition and some, some new HDR features and also some, um, some stitching of um, panoramic shots, including uh-huh. stitching of raw photos and panoramas yeah. as well. Also fully 64-bit in all versions. If you're a Creative Cloud subscriber, as I am, which is, by the way, one of the best deals out there, $10 a month gives you yeah. Photoshop and Lightroom and automatically updates to the next version every time, uh, you should be uh, getting that or getting a notice to get that. Face recognition I don't care so much about. Mm. Um, speed improvements, uh, new, new tools and brushes. Um, a, uh, I guess the faces is kind of like Apple faces, which is in photos and iPhoto mm-hmm. and aperture. High dynamic range tool. I've been using an external tool called Photomatics to do uh, HDR. I guess I should try Lightrooms now. 
So if you have Lightroom uh, upgrade, there'll probably be a paid upgrade for Lightroom 5 users uh, on, this, on the standalone version. We'll take a break. Come back. Gentlemen, prepare your picks. Our show today brought to you by Lynda.com. Hey, Hardy, congratulations to Linda and the team. Um, they just sold Lynda.com for a billion bucks to LinkedIn. That's great news for those of us who use Linda because that means now they're going to even get better and better new, new, new workshops, new classes. 3,000 on-demand video courses already on the site. Uh, if you are a problem solver, if you just like, you know, you want to make your brain bigger, you love learning. We all love learning. I think humans in their natural state are learning machines. Lynda.com is a great thing. You can learn how to create an app, how to build a responsive website. You better, too, by the way. Google's now penalizing you if you're not. Uh, master Excel. Sharpen your coding skills. L-Y-N-D-A.com has everything you need to feed that curious mind of yours. We talk about photography a lot. The foundations of photography and the Photography 101 series are, are great. Lisa's taking those right now. Ben Long's teaching one of them, who I love. There's Ben right there. He is just not only a sweet guy, a great photographer and a great teacher. And this is what's uh, every single course on lynda.com is a by working professional, but who is a great teacher. And then they give this, they, they have their beautiful studios. They shoot them marvelously. You get text transcripts so you can jump right to a particular part. And then once you get the basics out of the way, and this has been teaching uh, macro photography, which is awfully cool. Uh, you cover composition, exposure, all the basics. Then you can get the advanced tutorials on shooting portraits, landscapes, street photography, travel, time lapses, macro photography. Something for all experience levels. Go right now to lynda.com slash macbreak and sign up for your 10-day free trial. You get 10 days, the run of the place, and all the new courses will be yours. For Bert Monroy's amazing Photoshop courses, they're so good. It's just the greatest stuff ever. Lightroom, Photoshop, photography, web design, programming. It's all there. And you've got it all to yourself free for 10 days. But all you have to do is go to lynda.com slash MacBreak. We thank them so much for doing such a great product. Congratulate them on their, uh, on their new... Uh, I'm just so happy for Linda. 15 years old, that it's a startup. 15-year-old startup. I love that. I just love it. Linda.com. Well done, Linda. Time for picks of the week. Let's start with Renee Ritchie. So I'm, we're going to be inundated with Apple Watch apps starting Friday, and I wanted to get in ahead of the crowd. Uh, Twitterific is the granddaddy of Twitter apps. It was, it's, it's where a lot of the iconography we know, like the bird came from Twitterific, tweet came from Twitterific. It symbolizes so much of what we now consider to be Twitter, and they were there the first, they were there in jailbreak. They were there the first day of the App Store, the first day of the iPad App Store. I'm convinced if an Apple TV SDK comes out, <laughs> they would already be working on Twitterific for that. So it, it's, it's hard to be surprised that they have Twitterific already ready to go for the Apple Watch. Uh, they put up a little teaser uh, blog site about it. And, you know, as as is to be expected from the Icon Factory, it looks gorgeous. Uh, you can have the little mascot Ollie right there on your wrist. And it's, for me, one of the biggest things about the Apple Watch is going to be notification triage. I have very few notifications on. Very Almost none of them can actually make the, the my phone sound at all. Uh, and there's, I do DMs on Twitter. I don't do very much else. But being able to just quickly glance at something and see a short look and bring it closer and see a long look and know if it's important and if I need to stop and take care of it uh, is going to be really important. And they, there's the Twitter app, but more and more often, it feels like Twitter's interests aren't my interests and sort of the decisions they're making with interface and with features aren't the decisions that I want from Twitter. But um, Twitterific has always been just exactly what, what I've wanted, a classic Twitter client. Uh, and you can get the update now. It, it won't work until you get your Apple Watch, of course, but it's already baked in and it's going to be ready to go. Love the Icon Factory. They do such great stuff. They're terrific. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Oh, I can't wait. Just... And and I can use Siri to, to send a tweet using that, right? I I'm I'm I, it'll probably use the built-in Twitter functionality of iOS. It won't, oh, go, okay. but you don't need it to because all you're doing is sending a tweet. It's going to be a system function at that point. Yeah, can't wait. Twitterific. I use a Tweetbot. I do too on the iPhone because it reminds me of Tweety, which is just how my brain works when yeah, it comes me to Twitter. Too. Tweety, the original. 
<laughs> but I, uh, but I, and Twitter, Twitter was bought by Twitter. Uh, right. Lauren Brichter made it, and then they basically destroyed it and made the new Twitter app. And yeah. Tweetbot just reminds me of that. But I've always used Twitterific on the iPad because they have a combined timeline, so it's a very enjoyable reading oh, experience. I got to do it. Okay, so for Twitterific for the iPad, yeah. Tweetbot for the uh, iPhone, and we'll see for the uh, iWatch, the Apple Watch, yeah. which is the best. I There's presume no Tweetbot for Apple Watch yet. Not yet, but I presume everybody's got to be working on that, right? It can't be too hard to do, or is it? Uh, so the notifications are almost for free. Basically, any yeah. notification you currently have now will just work on the watch. You can add some fine grain controls, I believe, if you want to. Uh, then you can also make a glance, which is like a widget. And you can also make a watch kit extension, which ah. gives you interactivity. And that's what Twitterific has done. Uh, Tweetbot and the other clients would have to make those glances and widgets as I well. I imagine everybody's got to be doing it. Some people want to wait. They want to see. They want to take their time and see what intro. Because the, the, mm. the hardest thing so far has been figuring out what makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because um, Ben Bajaran Ben Bajaran said this: you have hours on the computer, you have minutes on the phone, and you have seconds on the watch. Because people just don't want to leave their wrist up for a long period of time. Right. So figuring out what the most important functionality is and giving that takes a little bit of thought. And I know several really good developers who want to wait and have a watch for a week or a month before they figure out what they want to do with it. Mr. Don McAllister, Screencasts Online, your recommendation. Right. Well, I've gotten with a gadget this time uh, rather than an application. I and like it's it. something that came in really handy on holiday recently. And it's this. This is the, and it's, you need to see this on video, but it's the Fayotech handheld <laughs> gimbal, hand gimbal for your um, GoPro. And it nice. just basically stabilizes your GoPro and turns it into a steady cam so that you can be walking along. Uh, there's no footsteps, nothing bounces up and down. You can actually do smooth pans. Uh, I was riding on the back of an elephant and it produced fantastically stable footage. Wait a minute, wait a minute, really, wait, really... slow down. I was riding on the back of an <laughs> elephant. Don't just skim by that there. Yeah, well, I did that India trip with, uh, with uh, ah, our geek friends. Fun. One of, the, one of the things was an Indian safari. And, uh, of course, you're bouncing up and down. Yeah. But with this on, it's just absolutely fantastic. It's, a, it's just, it's a, it's just a stick. It's not huge, yeah. It's 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 tiny and it's it's very portable, very lightweight. But you can you know no matter what motion you go, you can actually stabilize it. And it's sort of got three different three different modes as well. So you can actually, if I uh, just hold down the button, it actually stay in perfect location in three D space. Isn't that cool? But it, it's just it's just a really a great gadget. Now this is the G three. They've actually come out with a G four since, huh. uh, which has got these wires that are hidden, and you can also charge a GoPro from the batteries built into the handset. But when I was at NAB last week, uh, there's actually more coming out now. You can actually get these now for smartphones. So there's a couple now. Uh, I don't think they're on the market yet, but I did see a couple of prototypes of these similar things that you can just put an Android or uh, an iPhone onto it, and that turns your iPhone into a Steadicam. But, I, uh, it's, I, a, it's I a bought a device. crazy, crazy gimbal, the Nebula 4000. Mm -hmm. for my uh, Sony A7 camera, so for my SLR. Oh, right, yeah. But I had, it, it's a pain in the butt to use because you have to balance everything carefully before you can use it. And I, when we were out shooting our uh, uh, show open for the new screensavers, launching May 2nd on some of these same networks, um, we did a, we, we had, Greg Freeman, our uh, shooter, had a beautiful professional kind of Steadicam gimbal system. This is a very popular system now. But he also, he would spend, you know, he had a special person to balance the gimbal. Do you have to balance your right. gimbal? No, not this particular one because it is actually designed for the GoPro. If I actually just switch it off, it's, it sort of just goes limp when you switch it off. And then you just switch it on. So basically, uh, it goes into a rucksack. If I wanted to use it, I just pull it out my That's rucksack. Nice. There's a button on the bottom. You just press the button. That's and nice. then within a few seconds, it snaps into action. And you're ready to go. And it's so. a lot less money than my Nebula 4000, i got to tell you. I can well imagine. Yeah, 250 that, bucks U.S. for that. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah a bit I, more expensive over here in the U.K. Yeah. And I have one. I, I actually brought exactly the same one. <laughs> you like oh, right. that one. Uh, <laughs> approved. And, um, so, That's yeah, approved. I very much approve it. It, it, is, it, is, a, it is an amazing little bit. I, I shot a shot of my kids running across the back uh, of our yard, and I'm running full tilt behind them with that GoPro, and it's just like we're floating. It's just like I'm floating behind them. It, it, it was just, it was quite amazing. You know, um, there's just no vibration. I, uh, it was, it was quite a, quite an experience for me to experiment with. Again, I want one for my a, smartphone because it, it would double as a selfie stick, mm. right? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, the, no, the, would, yeah, did you say they make one or they're going to make one? No, there, there are some uh, 3D, not the same company. There are a couple ah. of uh, different Japanese and Chinese companies, a, a, NAB, but there are some with uh, with just a smartphone holder. I think you do have to balance that to set it up. Yeah. But this particular one is Look for the Look at this GoPro. Nebula 4000. The thing, it takes me an hour. 
I, I want to recommend it, but I just I have to get good at balancing the dang thing. All right. It's crazy. Crazy. And it's also like 800 bucks. Crazy. Do you, so what do you do, Alex? Do you, I mean, you guys probably have a real steady cam. We have a, a couple different things. So we have we have a steady cam. Yeah. Uh, and my, my brother Joe is now a steady cam operator. So is this the same cam. technology, gimbal technology, or is it different? Well, no, no. So so uh, steady cam is, is doesn't have any of this any of the gimbal stuff, but you can add them together. So for instance, I have a Ronin. It's probably what your DP was using for the thing. And so it's a Ronin, it's got two handles. Yeah. You put a red or a big yep, camera in the center. It. So I have yep. and, and so and what that is, is that a lot of this, all this gimbal technology really came from uh, drones because right. all the drones, they were building all these gimbal systems for the cameras. And then they realized, you know, it'd be really good if we just held on to these, you know, and yeah. so. Well, that's in fact uh, what makes the Ronin is DJI. The, the, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So I have the, so I have a Ronin uh, with a red camera that, that, that I use. Uh, then I have the, the little one for the GoPro. Um, those are great for getting those smooth shots. You don't right. have a, you have some control, but you don't have the artistic control that you'd have with a steady cam, which is a much more manual process. It's balancing uh, the camera, but uh, it's really like how it turns and everything else. It, it steadies it, but you really have control. So if you're doing a really like a film level control shot, a, one of these does not, in my opinion, replace a good steady cam operator. But most of us are bad steady cam operators, right. and so <laughs> as a result, this is really good for that up to about 80% of what you would use a steady cam for these will do that once you get over that you really need someone who's got years of experience you what you what you have passed i mean we did our first shows we bought the steady cam took a lesson and we're shooting with it you know and and it this would have been better <laughs> yeah. you know like this would have been a better solution for us for the kind of shots we were doing um so but so if you want to have that that artistic control you need to have a lot of experience or hire someone with a lot of experience if you want just steady shots of your kids, if you want steady shots for your short film, um, uh, walking behind people, uh, those are all things that are great. You can, again, also add these together. Some people are adding these gimbals to the steady cam. So you have some of the control and then this ultra, you know, it's, it's an entirely different feel. So um, there's a, and there's a lot of interesting creative things you can do because these are so stabilized. You can literally have one person hand the rig to another person. So you could have, you could be following someone, they get into a car, you oh. hand the rig to the person in the car and it follows along with them all in one single shot. Not if, not you know, if so, what you did was what, what Greg did, which he has this thing, which goes straps onto his waist and has a string that, can you see my screen? That comes over the top and holds the uh, road in. Yeah. <laughs> well, in a lot of ways, that's a stress reliever. You know, right. So that's, it's just to, because those, he's, it's a long time. He's got to hold that thing. So this exactly. helps him hold it. Yeah. Exactly. A lot of those those kinds of rigs do give it a little bit more um, a little more control, but yeah. it also uh, those things these rigs get really heavy. Um, you know, I know that my brothers can get up to you know seventy or eighty oh, yeah. pounds of gear. We use a steady cam uh, up in Canada for the lab with Leo, as you right. know. And uh, the operator, man, the guy was wearing it for four hours at a time, and man, that must have been just exhausting. It's it's a process, and they really have to pace themselves where they're shooting, and yeah. then you and then you set it down for a minute, or you yeah. throw it over your back. But yeah. you'll see that the, the good ones will get very good at how they manage their time because you really can only go. Most of them can, can only go fifteen or twenty minutes at that very That's outer exhausting. edge, and really only creatively for the yeah. first five or ten minutes. But this is kind of cool. I like I like the Ronin. That's pretty pretty amazing. It's I didn't realize great, DJ, I, DJI made them. Yeah. Well, again, they're taking the technology that was working for their drones and just applied it right. to something held. And of what course, the drone was, technology is basically a specialization of the Segway technology. So it was kind of appropriate <laughs> that we use the Ronin camera to shoot the uh, screensavers <laughs> open right. in which we are riding Segways. By the way, we decided to buy two of these, Alex. So the next time you're uh, you're around, I uh, want to get you yeah. on a Segway. I so want. Greg's uh, shooting this. So when we funny. come down, you'll see it most when we come down uh, Lombard Street, the crookedest street in the world. Uh, he's standing there with the Ronin uh, on, and is he's using the Canon Cinema cameras, those great cameras. C C three hundred. Yeah, yeah. Really, really. There we go. See, yeah, C three. He's on, the, and it's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. You're gonna be part of this, right, Alex? You have to come back. Yes. Wouldn't be the screensavers without you. I would. I can't wait. <laughs> it's it's you so can, awesome. <laughs> you can you can ride my Segway. <laughs> 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 May second, we're doing them Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern time. 
And that's uh, the new screensavers with many of the old screensavers part of it. In fact, our first show will uh, feature uh, uh, Patrick Norton as my uh, co-host. So, Alex, what do you got for us? So um, I have uh, a, a longtime Pixel member and a friend and a, just a really talented teacher. Um, Tony Farley is... Uh, uh, he put out a book, and, and I just love. Uh, every once in a while, I see a good eye. You know, someone starting to use, uh, you know, iBooks. You know, and, and expanding on it, and so on and so forth. And so, he has a book called Arduino Programming Circuits and Physics. Love it. And 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 so basically, if you want to learn how to how to you know start working with an Arduino, it really starts with plug the you know plug the USB in. Um, and really how to get started on pushing programs to the Arduino circuits. And then, you know, it's and, and what's interesting about it is it's not just a how to, you know, like, for instance, he gets into voltage and there's there's uh, an LEDs, but he gets into voltage and there's animations and they're talking about. Is this it, know, Tony so, Farley? Yeah, that's it. Awesome. And and. And uh, he's got 3D rendering that he did right. um, and uh, or, or, or some of his students. He teaches at San Leandro High School and um, just a really, really talented educator. And it, it's, a, it's 99 cents. It's, oh, I can't man. believe that it's 99 cents <laughs> with video. And, and then he's already said at the beginning that he's going to keep on updating it. So, it's just, you know, it's kind of like this living, you know, uh, book that he's going to keep on adding. So if you have, and, and that's the great thing about iBooks. Uh, and the way it's set up is he can just update it and, and uh, you know, he said he's going to update it for free and just keep on kind of jumping into it. But but there's a lot of, you know, the, the stuff's very clear. There's little step by steps. You'll see some of those being like one, two, three with little examples. There's videos in it. It's it's an amazing value for, for 99 cents. So uh, and, and, and really just a great book either way. I, I have a couple of Arduino books because I've been playing with it. And and this is one of the clearest ones that I've seen. Would this um, be appropriate really for home use? Uh Oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's it's designed for both teachers. I mean, because there's workbooks and there's little things at the end that you can go through to make sure you understand it. Uh, but you could definitely use this if you wanted to get started with, uh, you know, working with Arduino. Um, and Indeed. so uh, and, it's, and it's, if you had a kid who was uh, so inclined, uh, yes. what a great way to uh, do some, some hands on stuff. Well, and I've been kind of hacking around with it, and what I what I actually want to do is do it with my my kids, you know. And so we kind of go through each one of these very systematically and talk about uh, talk about the stuff so that they can kind of get their head around it. I've been, you know, of course playing with the the, the um, little bits and and yeah. mind storms, yeah. but but I think it's time to start, you know, really uh, playing with something a little more serious. And so um, so anyway, so I think that it's a it's a great little book, and it's definitely worth. Uh, uh, supporting him and also and also getting to uh you know getting started with uh, arduino if it's something you've been trying to figure out how you're going to get started it's 55 bucks for the ultimate collection know, on, on on amazon so if you want to learn how to do this it costs nothing and then you get this book for 99 cents and you start wiring away and you can be the geek that you always wanted to be physics ibook.com is tony farley's site and it'll give you links so you can buy this it's on the ibook store only 99 cents Tony Farley, Arduino Programming Circuits and Physics at physicsibook.com. And he's got other books up there, too. And yeah, he's, yeah. He's, uh, he's a prolific uh, iBook yeah. developer. Yeah, and, and it's all about physics and stuff, which is, hey, who, who, who doesn't love that? Exactly. I should have put this on an iPad to show you. This is a, a game that uh, I, I don't know how I found it, but now that I found it, I can't stop playing it. It's called Hook. And it's a puzzle game, uh, iPhone or iPad. Um, and it, it starts out very simple. If you played Bleck, remember how much we loved Bleck? Mm -hmm. This is like, a, a, let me turn it up. I don't, you know, it says wear headphones. It's really, it's, you know, the sound's not that important. It's one of those games where there's no explanation at all. You just kind of learn by doing. And it's at first very simple. You're solving uh, puzzles. There are certain rules you will learn. And uh, as you solve it, but it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. The idea is to clear the screen by pressing the buttons. And if stuff is intertwined, you know, for instance, if I press this button, it won't be able to withdraw the line because this one's in the way. And it'll say, nope, got to start over. Which, by the way, if you've done a lot of clearing and in the later levels you will have, starting over is a punishment. <laughs> It's a it, oh, see, can't, whoop, wrong button, wrong button. Got to press this button, then that button. This looks really easy, doesn't it? Get to level 40, then tell me how easy it is. And it won't take you too long to get to level 40. These are just basically tutorial levels. It is, uh, I think it's a buck. It's not expensive, and it, it is totally addictive. I showed Lisa last night, <laughs> and uh, she, she literally 
went to 40 or 42, stayed up way late. It's one of those games you play and you go, oh, I'm going to stay up late and solve this one. It's a lot of fun. Hook. Just, you know, a little, everybody should have a little, there you go. How much is it? 99. Just a little puzzle. Everybody should have a little puzzle game. It's got a good soundtrack. You could almost do this um, on an iWatch. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this edition of Mac Break Weekly. Thank you, Don McAllister. Great to see you, my friend. No, thanks for having me on. Sorry, I missed good. you in Vegas, man. Oh, never mind. Never mind. Next time. What? What? Any big? You're the big traveler. You were riding an elephant in India. <laughs> Last <laughs> yeah. time I saw you, we were on the Great Wall of China. Are you going anywhere cool soon? Um, there's an event that's actually just been published or uh, promoted today. Um, just a, a, a Mac. Uh, Sort of gathering, really. Thing called um, what's it called? It's like a it's like a Mac festival. What's it? Mac stock. That's Mac stock. Like, I like the name. Like Woodstock, but Mac stock. Yeah, yeah it's in it's in Chicago. Um, it's just a day's conference and uh, like a barbecue thing afterwards. But uh, a lot of people who used to go to Mac World are going to that. So uh, I'll be going to that in June, and then to Canada in September, going for a Ooh. holiday to Canada. Come visit us. Uh, in Canada. We're close to Canada. <laughs> Staying a left at Vancouver, you'll, you'll get there. <laughs> okay. Oh, Max Stock is Canada. actually in Woodstock, but not Woodstock, New York. Woodstock, Illinois. Ah, right. And uh, Allison Sheridan's writing about it, too. It's MaxStockConferenceAndExpo.com, and it's in June. Yeah, I well, think it was put together because Macworld had finished. Yeah, um, there's some. an awful big social group of people who really haven't got anywhere to hang out anymore. So yeah. um, I think this has been put on to... Uh, to, to let us all, 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 all the small community of uh, really fervent Mac people to actually Good. go along and hang out. So, it's, so there are going to be lots of Mac podcasters there. There'll be some sessions, and I think there'll be some food as well. But uh, yeah, should sounds be sounds fun. And of course, everybody should go to screencastonline.com, and uh, that's where uh, you're going to see uh, Don's working hard on his new photos screencast. Yes. It's going to be a two part. So I'll be covering the setup this week, and then looking at the uh, the app next week, and also the iOS side of things as well, because I still do the Mac and the iOS stuff as well. So nice. It's all there. It's all there. It's the place to be. Screencastsonline.com. Don's on Twitter at Don McAllister. That's the one. Renee Ritchie, iMore.com, and you've got a whole bunch of articles on photos too. And I have to say, I highly recommend them because this is there's some hidden stuff in photos. It's not obvious. And we're adding stuff all the time. I think we added two more yesterday. Yeah. Good. iMore.com. And, of course, uh, you know that he does some great podcasts uh, there as well, the, like the Debug podcast. So uh, if you go to iMore, you'll find it all there. It's great to see and you again, Renee. Thank you. might have a here. ton of Apple Watch stuff landing on Friday. You might. No spoilers. You I might. <laughs> you've, got a, you've got a key word for Apple Watch. You already have a lot of stuff. Who's going to be your yeah. Apple Watch point person on this? Serenity? Um, myself and Serenity, yeah, and Allie. I mean, we, we, we're a small team with four, four people, so we kind of... The whole uh, team? Just, yeah, we're four people, so we kind of all just do everything. Peter does most of the Mac stuff. Serenity is going to do a little bit more watch stuff. Allie does the how-to stuff, but it overlaps so much. I had no idea it was such a small team. You guys crank out so much great stuff. Mm. There's a newsroom. We don't have to do news. The news is taken care of by our network. So ah, I get it. Content. I get yeah. it. And then there's Team iMore right here. And don't forget Georgia. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yep, Team I more. Renee, Serenity, Ali, Peter, and Georgia. I like it. We're all still smiling there because the watch hasn't landed yet. <laughs> the writing, let the writing <laughs> begin. Uh, thank you so much. Great to see you again. And to Alex Lindsay, uh, pixelcore.com, at Alex, L I N D S A Y, on the Twitter. And, and, and we've got Final Cut, uh, the virtual user groups coming back uh, a week from Friday. Uh, so um, I'm sorry. Uh, no, yeah, a week from Friday. So it takes me a little bit, a little bit of time here to get my Good. head around where Good. what date I'm in. But uh, May first, uh, and and I'll announce more information on Twitter. Um, but uh, we'll be bringing in all the usual suspects and talking about the new Final Cut in great detail. So uh, it should be a lot of fun. Fantastic, folks. Mm -hmm. We do Mac Break Weekly every Tuesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC, and we love it if you watch live because you can talk in the chat room and it's a great way for us to feel like we're you know involved you can also visit live we do ask you uh, email us if you plan to be in our studio we have we'd love to have you just email tickets at twit.tv so we can put out a chair for you and of course if you can't be here live or watch live you can always get on demand audio and video after the fact that's 
twit.tv slash mbw for MacBreak Weekly. Twit.tv slash mbw. Or search iTunes or your favorite podcast client. Or uh, on mobile. We're everywhere on mobile. And uh, that's also, I know for most people, the easiest way to do it. Uh, we have great apps, too, uh, thanks to our third-party developers. Uh, just search for uh, Twit in your mobile store, T-W-I-T. -T. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. Now you, you get back to work, because you know what? Break time is over.